Well then, hello and welcome to the next part of the show where we talk about dragons and stuff for, uh, for right. a few hours. We talk about Dungeons and Dragons. The Continuing dragon on, show, if you will. From where we were was episode four being completed. Rhaenys is dead, so she can no longer harm the uh, the story, but she can no longer add to it either. Let's be fair. Melis was cool. Not going to take that away from her. But and uh, Rhaenys should be cool, but unfortunately, episode nine exists. Well, I was going to say as well that uh, with her exit, they have risen yet another replacement to uh, ruin the story whenever she turns up, so <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, well, yes, to begin, uh, which would be suitable as the first scene, you have Corlys in Driftmark uh, walking up to his throne and just staring at it for a little bit until he... Um, just sits down and is tearing up, which is always appreciated as like, uh, we don't need any words. We don't need him on his knees yelling, saying, why did everyone I love why have to die? Why? <laughs> and, um, yeah. as marriages are like alliances and for, you know, political gain and whatnot. These people do actually care for each other, as it turns out. Yeah, Crazy the... as it may seem. Story of Corlys is one that is interesting enough that I really do wish we had more of him. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a strong member of this cast as well as in this, the world. He's uh, made many choices, as he stated in season one, to further his legacy. We find a bit more about that in these uh, coming episodes as to why he makes certain choices. But now he's uh, having to reckon with those decisions being made, leading to now losing those individual family members. He's uh, He lost a lot at this point. And... They have put pieces in place with those uh, those lads in the shipyard for uh, if he's going to need an heir. I mean, there's nothing else to really interpret from those scenes with uh, uh, Alan, right? You know, we assume he's going to be... Is it naturalized? Or what's the term for when you turn a bastard into a um, like an official son or whatever? Because they do it in Game of Thrones. I just can't remember. Um, nep nepotism? No, no, no. When they take a bastard and and give them a name like John, going from John Snow to being offered John Stark. Yeah, I, I remember what it. Uh, uh, there's, there's a name for it. I'm pretty term sure, slipping but. my mind too. In any case, that seems to be where Adam is probably going to head, especially with all is feeling pretty bad about his family getting thinner and thinner. Poor lad. Can't help but feel bad for him. Anyway, mm. we then move on. Oh, you get, you get the, the, the reaction shots, of course, of Rhaenyra mourning Rhaenys as well, which is fair and important. I respect it. Obviously, I cared more about Corliss's reaction, but still. Yeah. Um, it's acknowledgement uh, for the bastards. Then we have King's Landing uh, watching a bunch of people. They still have food, but it's pretty shit. You know, it's like it's, it's like thin, food. small, yeah. a lot of it's rotting, very small portions. It's... um. I think it actually like better as a representation of a coming famine as opposed to just everybody doesn't have any food. It's like, well, they would, it would be all, you know, it's coming in. And uh, it, they may have a supply somewhat from the land. This was actually something I spoke to with um, uh, Glidus and Goga. Uh, it seems like they probably should have a better supply from the land, to be honest. They've got a lot oh, of places. Much, Considering uh, the geography like... of things, I would have to imagine they would. Probably. No, not really, because whenever I watch these shows and they show the picture of like a castle or a city or something, there's no nothing farms. outside of the walls. <laughs> it's just you mm -hmm. have a landscape, you have the city and the walls, and there's just nothing apart from that. There's, it's not full of farms and buildings yeah. and marketplaces and bazaars, and it's yeah, the a thing that I hate so much in fiction. It's like you're, you just, it's just wilderness, and then boom, city. And then that's it. It's it's not surrounded by stuff. I guess and it, it always annoys me. I think it's not picturesque enough if you've got a bunch of farmland around. Uh, it looks terrible the way it is. It's 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 like just re it's like a an empty field and then city wall. Yeah, they might it's maybe like, they would uh, argue it's it's yeah. less imposing as a castle and it's more work to to CG in all that shit or something. Even though I agree, yeah, it would it be better. Would be. Well, it would, yeah, because guess... that's why no one does it, because it would actually be work to show all those things. But every single time, I have to try and get my brain to be like, "Don't ask what the, what do they eat? Don't ask what do they do." Case ask what of like, eat. you gotta you gotta genuinely wonder what the average person's perception is of the Middle Ages and what it looked like based on all of the media 
that's being yeah, well, exactly. I think they're figuring things like that are outside the bounds of what most audiences care about. So they're just like, really, because Holy Grail is probably the closest you get to like <laughs> what the pop culture perception of the medieval period is. The yeah. thing I guess so because is... they never show it. I mean, you'll say that, but they'll have me. crazy accuracies I... with like armors and swords and shit. Every yeah, once in they a while, will. You know? so, yeah. The the resources the resource shortage though has a big effect on the the two episodes that we're covering today. So it, it, like it is actually affecting the story that there aren't say like livestock being raised on the crown land. That's no, yeah, exactly, that. exactly that. Um, that's, that's a good point, but uh, most people don't even notice. <laughs> well, that's yeah, the well, thing. Uh, I guess uh, that's being, the what I'm trying to say. To come in. What I'm trying to say is, if if it's expensive and unnecessary to shoot it, I entirely understand that. But the thing is, I, that doesn't answer why it's becoming a problem that it's not there. That it's not like okay, we assume that there are farms that we're just not seeing in these shots or something, right? Well, even, it's because uh, the, the spaces around castles generally should be more developed around castles and yeah, estates, and like yeah. family homes. This is yeah. This is a huge city. And all those people have to eat. Well, they've and they been a piece for ages, and stuff. too. And, yeah, and so not, every, not every castle anything. is just there to, like, hold land. Not everyone is, like, a fortress castle. Some of them are yeah. just, like, homes in that sense. So, yeah, all slowly but homes. surely, societies and, like, uh, townships just build up around them. Yeah, and then, so you'd think they'd have a, maybe a more secure supply for themselves, at least to use the land around them, but also just supplies from places like Old Town or other areas of the Reach, they would have something. I think they do get small mentions, and maybe if you want to try and headcanon it as they are getting supplies from there, and that's why the people of King's Landing haven't died, but they're on short supply, because they don't have anything from the docks, you know? So, maybe. I, I think... I, I think they were getting things from the the ocean, though, primarily, because I think there's a line in episode six where um, one of the I, I think it's the girl that Eamon's with in the brothel. She says something to the effect of like, is it going to be fish, fish, fish and a side of fish? And, it's, and when she's saying the Targaryen possible bastard girls got taken up that they got wined and dined by the noble, the nobles, and they had red meat and vegetables. And it was... Uh, yeah, like so, it's implied that without shipments, they are not getting red meat or vegetables in King's Landing. I think. So but that the I only think, people. I, I think the contention is as to why that is the case, yeah. considering yeah, uh, I know, the layout I know. of King's Landing. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. Westeros it's a bit of a general. problem. Well, and especially empty crown this is land. an emergency now, so they should surely have sent ravens to be like, "Hey, we need more yeah. supplies in King's Landing. Help your kingdom," you know. Mm-hmm. There'd be some level of surplus, hopefully, something to spare from the uh, the kingdoms that are loyal to them. In any case, um, you know, we might talk about that a bit more as time goes on, but they're parading the head of Melis through King's Landing. Cole thought this was a strong idea, and you know what? Ooh. It would have been, probably, if we were remembering a certain scene happened in Season 1, but the writers want to pretend it didn't happen. Um... If we pretend it didn't happen for a moment, the idea with this scene is supposed to be that the world of Westeros at this point is very much... They've been, like, taught and raised to understand dragons are like gods, they're god beings, yeah. and that nothing but respect and admiration and, and just, just, oh my god, they're incredible, look at those things. And so parading the head of one of them as being like, we defeated this creature is a bad omen, as described by Masaria later. The only problem, of course, is that this is the is very same true? dragon that killed, <laughs> killed many, <laughs> many innocent people, people who very likely had family in these onlookers right now. And I'm, I'm not kidding. If, if it had killed my mum or dad or sister or brother or kids, and they're like, we killed that fucking demon, I'd be like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> like, fuck that thing. I mean, we did it's it. It's also probably going to be a non-insignificant proportion of the gods favor us. Because we like a yeah, beast we... like that was felled by our cause, like and you this could is call it like a, to an extent a traitor a than our cause is just. Like Melis is arguably a traitor to the crown, right, or something. You yes. could you could run that sort of thing. Well, they're all traitors. Yeah, every everyone on the side of the blacks is a traitor to the crown, and I guess that would include dragons. Yeah, <laughs> those <laughs> wouldn't people have realized that Sunfire hasn't returned yet? Um, no one would see they? it. No one. Wouldn't, I mean, no one so would see when he just it arrived, back, right? I mean, you can you can make up whatever story you want. Sunfire is out there patrolling. That's where Sunfire is. They don't even know that Aegon is injured necessarily yet, right? Because they've hidden him in that. Like they they, they trickle out information. Mm -hmm. and of course, it will escape eventually. 
uh, all we get on Sunfire is um, that he's long in the dying, I think is how Cole describes it. Mm -hmm. Which is curious to me, because you'd think they'd just say dead if Sunfire was going to be dead. Long in the dying means alive, so yeah. I, I, think, <laughs> I don't think we're done with Sunfire. In yeah, that probably capacity. not. Which is a curiosity. I wonder what role Sunfire's going to play, or, or like, are they going to get it back, or is it just going to be chilling out near Rick, Rook's Rest? <laughs> just like a... Sunfire, Sunfire was crippled, so I don't imagine... Yeah, that wing got fucked he's up. He's going anywhere very fast. Well, of course they could move him somewhat if uh, he's willing, but I don't even know if he would. You know, it would maybe it yeah, wasn't in the CG willing, budget to show how he's doing. And I think it's fair to leave that ambiguous for now because I don't know how many people are going out to check on a lonely wounded dragon necessarily, yes. cornered animal syndrome and all that. And hey, with some extra knowledge, it's kind of fun watching Hugh see the head of Melis and saying dragons are just meat. Considering where his story ends up, uh, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, Aegon has moved in, and he is he is not doing well. Uh, a lot of his armor is like singed into his skin. Half of him is seemingly burned. His leg is broken, struggling to breathe. It's not, not great. To be honest with you, I think most people would reasonably have expected him to just die uh, after mm -hmm. seeing what happened. But you know what? Maesters, they know their shit, all right? They're going to do everything they can. I will say this part was uh, quite cringeworthy. It usually is when there's a lot of deep medical shit, especially a setting bone. Oh, yeah. That makes me go, Ugh. Yeah. yeah, pretty rough. And actually, the prying the, Valer the hot Valerian steel off of the scab burn and with mm. the blood coming out of the... the like yeah. Basically, the, the, the metal is ripping his skin apart, and that's what's causing the bleeding. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, that, that's rough. It was crazy too because they that's like the most advanced medicine that they're using but you can't help but be like god you guys have shit tools <laughs> but then maybe that's how we're seen by the future they'll be like you guys barbarians even with your lasers i'd be most worried about his airway and breathing like with, with that kind of burn it's um yeah all over his torso it would not be easy for him to continue I mean, breathing he'd probably honestly have a lot of swelling in his airway he did pretty well considering right he could have been enveloped oh, yeah. by Vega's fire which is not cold uh it looks like the armor might have protected him as much as uh, cold. it got him oh yeah yeah his, his brother was certainly cold in that moment ice cold like if he's not dead this certainly does justice to uh the damage he took shall we say Oof, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah Allison uh just looking guilty as fuck incredibly sad obviously the last time she interacted with him she told him he was useless and to do nothing while drinking. So oh I can't boy. help but assume that's he weighing heavy on it. I do like as well, she spots the Silent Sisters and immediately starts panicking that he's going to die because they're usually only there for corpses. And they're probably just like, don't mind us, we're just watching. We yeah. don't know what's going to happen. Just in case. We're, we're on call. Yeah. Even in the modern day, having burns like that, to that, across that amount of your body, oof, would just be yeah, absolutely, yeah, like... the pain would be absolutely intolerable. I Aegon has an exciting life ahead of him. Um, yeah, and just really, really, really good performance. And so she's uh, a little curious. She's going to go talk to Cole, see what's going on. And I like that she asked him what happened, and of course he could say anything technically to that question. And uh, the first thing he says is, we took the castle at the cost of 900 men. So I that like that... It shows his... pretty clearly where his mind's at. Yeah. What's particularly uh disturbing him at the moment which is the just how the dragons have massively uh escalated the amount of carnage that's going to ensue because yeah. there's something that absolutely cannot be controlled for especially once they start fighting like once yeah. vegar and melee started tangling like what's anyone else going to do about that yes, Run away. Nothing. Yeah, and accept your fate whatever it's like, it um, may be. it's like having a chess game where you know, the rules are set, and it's really down to the skill and the number of whatever, everything's going on. But when a dragon arrives, just fucking spins the whole board. No one knows what's happening. There's nothing to control, and it's just like, well, I guess whoever has more and bigger ones, that's it. That's all it would be. Who knows what well, the yeah, fuck's that's, going on. It's the, it's the pigeon on the chessboard, but it's like an actual game piece. 
Yeah. There is an actual just pigeon that is supposed to come and land on the board and yeah. it'll just start kicking <laughs> pieces over. Kicking all the other pieces. And you're not allowed to do anything. <laughs> and it's it's if modern. You try to show him away, he'll go like, no, or cool, cool. And then just coo, like, coo. It, it's effectively modern Warcraft being used in a situation where everyone else is limited to medieval technology. They might as well have summoned in a Harrier jet. It's also yeah. substantially more horrifying because we mercifully don't have much need of like an airborne flamethrower. <laughs> that's yeah. kind of a horrifying. <laughs> I actually have. Been, I'm in need of. I that. have I need, need of such of things. I have. Uh, I, 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 well, I, I guess I probably. I don't closest, want to know about what problems you've got that you need one of those. Napalm. Napalm. <laughs> does. I'd say it would probably be the closest airborne flamethrower. Yeah. Sure. Which yeah can be very much known as a horrifying weapon in its uh, heyday. Yeah. That's true. That's why uh, that's why Vermithor's nickname is Agent Orange. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and so yes, he's uh, focused on lives lost and the horror at play. And uh, it's interesting that when she prods him for more information about Amond, he's just not willing to confirm anything, which in and which, of itself uh... is pretty strong confirmation. But. It also doesn't put him in a difficult position. Because yeah, at like this point, it, he needs to start making some very important choices about whose uh, side he's going to take. It does feel like he doesn't know yet what he wants to say, because he doesn't know what his role is right now, or what's going to happen next. But simultaneously, when Allison asks you, what the hell happened? Like, what... what, what, what his mom. <laughs> like, what, what was Eamon's part in all of this? And you just go... Mm -hmm. Who can say? You know, I heard he was <laughs> around. Like, well, yeah, it's 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 not as good as if he was like, "What do you mean? Like, why? What are you even? What are you suggesting or implying?" Uh, oh, it's, it's, that like, Amon. Oh, like, the uh, guy with one eye or the other yeah, one? Oh, blonde, one eye. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's the thing is, is like, well, Aegon's probably not going to be in charge right now, so you know, you should probably be thinking ahead, right? <laughs> like, combine this with her having spotted that he's already taken Aegon's uh, super knife from the dad and like what the fuck uh, what did you do and then it's just like do you yeah. really think he wouldn't you know I wouldn't be surprised if he was at least partially yeah he's just partially afraid of Aemond oh yeah like, absolutely for sure confirms or denies either way yeah because he knows that Aemond's a anything. fucking nutcase now <laughs> Well, he was about Eamon to watch Dolan. him execute his oh. fucking king in yeah. front of him. And he's like, Eamon, what the... <laughs> well, of course, Eamon, given... no. Checking to make sure oh, my sword uh, was good. Given yeah. that Cole trained him personally, he yeah. already would know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you don't even really want to take him in close quarters, like, in a sword fight, let alone all of the power that he wields um, strategically and just with a dragon. It was kind of fascinating, right? Because his, uh, once again, his loyalty to the crown, the honor that he draws from that role, is now at odds again, because he serves both of those guys. They fucking, one of them's killing the other. It's like, uh, I already have enough issues figuring out... What am I to do? <laughs> ...what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? Anyway. I think, that before we move too far, though, from Eamon's dagger, like, having the dagger that, like, has the Song of Ice and Fire on it, like, it's possible that that could be a reason why Damon... Hey, sorry, Eamon... God, I'm, I'm mixing them up now. Eamon might think that he is, like, the prince that was promised. That is a card they could pull found... at any point. I'm not sure if they will, though. We'll have to see. Because he could have yeah, read that you know, knife I... for sure. Yeah, and it does a lot, I think, to justify his motivations going forward. He's like, okay, well, it's up to me to save the world now. Yeah. Um, I wonder how broadly interested he is in that capacity, though, or how selfish he feels. Or how convincing of... it would even be to him yeah. right, to read that. Mm -hmm. It could just be a story, or could be more. But, uh, I mean, he's had his own sort of plans laid in wait for a long time. Sort of the, the story on the knife could add to it, but it simultaneously could be something he thinks is bullshit. He probably reads High Valerian as well. We know he can speak it very oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. He for sure reads it. And, like, we know Eamon wants to rule in some capacity, but we don't know exactly why, I guess, is what I mean. What does he want to do with that power, if anything? Or does he just want to have it? No! Hmm. Oh, uh, probably. At, oh, sorry, go ahead. Off to the Black Council. Once again. Which, the scenes I associate more negatively than I do with the Green Council. Let me give an assessment as to why. The councillors are annoyed with Rhaenyra because she's not making good decisions slash not making any decisions. And they're talking about suggestions. 
and all that sort of thing. And she says, do you take issue with me? And he says, uh, Sir Alfred, I could never doubt your capability or your quickness of mind. It is merely that the gentler sex heretofore has not been much privy to the strategies of battle or their execution. There's been peace in our lifetime. You've seen, uh, uh, sorry, she says there's been peace in our lifetime and uh, you've seen no more battles than I have. I thought it was a really interesting counter. A lot of people thought that was actually mm -hmm. quite strong for me, but I thought um, part of her issue in, in later in the episode is that because she's a girl, she wasn't taught how to do the battle sword, slash yeah. understand war. And then yeah. on top I, of that, because like, it's, it's, it's been peacetime she... for everybody's lifetimes, right? So it's, it is mm -hmm. going to be down to people who were more likely taught how to actually run it. But secondly... Would that not then mean she should give deference to people like him on the council? Is he not there to do that? Should she not listen to him, you know, with whatever that's, he has to counsel? She's like, I wasn't taught how to do this. It's like, well, I was. That's entirely the point of a council of people. They're there but to advise. Something that annoys me more, and I don't know if this is intentional or not, because the writers can uh, annoy me sometimes. She never chose to discover anything more about this. She, like, yes, he would have been trained more so than she was because of the difference between man and woman or whatever. But remember, as a cupbearer, she barely took that seriously, even though she had more access to information and learning than basically 99% of the kingdom. But she didn't, like, take it seriously. She's like, oh, cupbearer. And it's like, what do you mean? You have ears and you can actually say things, too. It's not like anyone's going to hurt you. Um, and, it, and it bothers me then that the future of your life, she never pursued interest. Do you remember she has like a little rant about how she knows all the castle names, but she doesn't know the difference between two parts of a sword? Whatever, and it's like, well then go find out. Go learn. And right also, now. Yeah. You, you don't need to. That's not important to you. That's also true. Yeah, the names of the castles are way more important than the difference between two parts of a sword. Uh, for you know, the attributes of them. What Let the people who are actually be. making war know the parts of a sword from each other. That yeah. actually matters to them. The smiths and the soldiers need to know that part, but yeah. you need to actually know the names of the castles. That is actually important where they are. So yeah, the um, I think the show is on her side. While a lot of these scenes, I'm on the counselor's side. If yeah, I were there, I'd be saying the similar things. It, fairness, bit more credit. The show seems to think that the counselors are doing this incredible disservice by having the advisors advise. It's really, really strange to me. Like, they will give all of their impressions or opinions or whatever that we can't necessarily make a definitive call one way or the other on, but she's getting information from people who are ostensibly more trained in the subject than she is. And then that's apparently her just being, like, micromanaged. I wonder if, if it was a king who theoretically was in precisely the same position, they would have done the same thing. I, yeah. It's it's just like it, it is a bit weird, isn't it? It's like how dare they question her leadership? When like, they yeah. presumably uh, have been brought okay. here to offer their wisdom, is that not the whole fucking point? I thought that's, that's a, the whole point of a council. Not to go to medieval history too much, but that was sort of the social attitude as to how like advisors would treat their queen. It is it is like the rudder of the nation that needs to be steered. Nation not being the right word. Nation didn't really exist well, yet, but. And yeah. to the to the point, if you wanted to write it such that she was efficient in this, but none of them took her seriously, and that she was right on a couple of things and they ignored it, that's one thing. But that's not how this has been written. She's, all that's happened so far is that she's made several massive blunders. Yeah, yeah. She lost most one of the, of the time, most powerful weapons. Most of the time, she doesn't make any decisions. But when she does, some of them are the most stupid fucking decisions we've seen. So. Yeah, the, the show understands and sympathizes with her lack of education on this sort of matter, but then takes offense to the idea that she listened to the instruction of others. That have been educated, I yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I guess the show's... I, I guess the show's trying to say that if it hasn't shown us much of those guys giving really good ideas, that we should assume they're not. But I think the problem is you... You haven't shown us why Rhaenyra's ideas are better, really. Well, we, well, we don't have any context for really any of their ideas, I would exactly, say. You get, yeah. you get the surface level, which is something they had to throw in. They couldn't have these scenes being that none of them suggest anything, because like, they suggest answering Rook's Rest and like uh, the Darklin sort of uh, kingdom slash lordship and everything. As in, take people there and take them back. Uh, another suggestion is we go for uh, Vagar now because uh, she's going to be depleted slash injured from the fight. You know, the, mm -hmm. these are suggestions. There's something that could be done. And then the the point of the scene, I guess, is that Rhaenyra can't figure out what the correct course of action is. And so instead she just sits down, and, you know, pouts, doesn't make a decision, mm -hmm. which is not good. <laughs> 
And you know yeah, what else would help is if she had a fucking matter. hand. But for some reason, she doesn't want to have a hand right now. I would honestly be okay with the idea of her dithering and not making a decision if the camera almost seemed to understand that she is not making good decisions in this way, I guess. Yeah. Um, we'll get more on that. Like, the Black Council meetings start to frustrate me more and more as time goes on. But the Green Council ones are top tier, so don't worry. Anyway. Yes, they are. Uh, Baylor and Jace have a little chat. Um, Jace is pretty frustrated that he can't really do anything, and so actually intends to go see Damon to see what he's up to. See if he's, like, loyal still. And, uh, I think Baylor essentially tells him that's probably not a great idea. And he instead comes up with the idea to go to the twins and secure the phrase loyalty, which uh, could be considered somewhat risky, but ends up oh, it's relatively working out. Not a lot to say on that scene. The relationship between Jace and Baylor probably could have benefited from something more. They shared about, I want to say, two private scenes, and they've uh, one of them was expositional, the other one was arguably character, but it just, just wasn't a lot in there. Um... I feel like we know Jace a significant amount better than we know Baylor. I don't really know her at all. She yeah, so dragon. far, not that much. Um, in which case, we move on over to Damon trying to convince the Brackens to uh, be loyal to him. And he basically just says, I'm going to have my dragon eat you if you don't join. And the Brackens are like, no. Which um, is kind of cool. Honestly, especially when faced directly with Caraxes, and they illustrate that quite well with a shot where the guy is just slowly moving away, and Caraxes' head fills up the entire screen behind him. <laughs> so, um, especially with Damon, you're like, oh, they're just gonna—he's just gonna kill him then. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing, right? Damon threatens that, and he's confused almost as to how it doesn't work, and obviously the point yeah. of his journey here is he has no idea how to deal with the river men the, the river lands in general um, to put up a kind of resistance that he's just not used to in the way that it's principled i guess yeah and in the following a great cut they use too like when they go from the the dragon looking like it's about to kill to just damon sitting with his his elbows on his knees like <laughs> i didn't think they'd be so eager to die <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, um, what I like about it is you might have thought for a second, why didn't you kill him then? Is it like a message? But he's like, I kind of want yeah. them. He's like, I need swords, not corpses. Mm. Well, and also you just want sense. men like that. They'd be neat to have loyal yeah. to you. So he's... Uh, rather yeah, burn than succumb. Having to think about a way around it. And unfortunately, his friend here, Willem Blackwood, suggests something with enough subtlety that we have no idea what it truly meant in the scene, but at least we know now, and I think we find out this episode at least, so we can sort of talk about it contextually there. Damon wants him to hit them in particularly uh, cruel weak spots, like wives, children, and uh, let's say sacred or ritualistic places, maybe like temples and stuff, just you know, at the cover of night, just fuck them up in that way. And uh, if they don't take that threat enough... You know, I guess we'll step it up even more, but that should probably do it. Because Damon, for some reason, is still trying his way, and, uh... Well, it's not gonna have good, great results, and, um, you know, this guy's on board with it because he's very much a passionate, uh, Blackwood, being that he despises everything about the Brackens, and so he would do anything to him. He's just looking for an excuse. Yeah. Um... You know, this is a this is a way for Damon to solve problems that may have worked in other scenarios, but it ain't gonna work this time. Hoping it will. And obviously, he said the most important part is don't fly the royal flag when doing what you're about to do. Don't take that banner in. Don't let it be the crown that gets connected to this action. We'll see about that. Anyway, over to the eerie, which um, has been an interesting conversation. You have. Jane Aaron is the lady of, of uh, the Eerie, I guess, for now. Um, she made a deal with good old Rhaenyra for a dragon protection in exchange for, I think, 15,000 men. Uh, she got given two baby dragons, which is pretty Yo. pathetic. And she's not exactly happy about this. And uh, Raina 
has the balls to say that she should have probably specified what size she wanted uh, if she should if she wanted a bigger one. It it's just you, you it feels like dumbass. one of of many instances in the show of essentially the the powerful characters in the world realizing wait a minute people won't just do exactly what I need them to do in exchange for nothing at all <laughs> like to just say to someone well you know technically it's a dragon like as if that even addresses anything about the problem that you face right now like what do you think she'd say to that ah. Good point. All right, well, guess I'll just help you in exchange for nothing. This, this fucks with the standing of the house, because you now know that House yeah. Targaryen, or at least the Blacks, can't or won't follow through sometimes. Well, just lie. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah. this is, yeah. I, I'm willing to call this a lie. They gave her two baby dragons. They can't yeah. do shit. Yeah, that's yeah. a lie. She's fucking around. And, um... What's funny is... crazy that she thinks she's in a position to say this to her, like, when she's doing you a favor. Yeah, and I'll I'll ha I'll try and bring in like criticisms I'm aware of that come from not necessarily myself, but outside of uh, like in in the fan or whatever. But I've seen people be angry that Lady Jane Aaron is a lot more uh, cool and supportive in the source compared to this scene, and they don't like that she's mean to Rayna, which I thought was really interesting because I thought she was, if anything, pretty chill compared to what she probably should be. Uh, well, I mean, chill considering what her position is right now, which is that her uh her home is um in disproportionate danger I mean, without yeah. anything to compensate them if uh Eamon so wished he could fly vega over here and just burn her entire castle if he wanted yeah. to and what what would anybody be able to do about it nothing. they don't have any dragons to protect them so there's nothing they're just doing uh, but I don't know I feel like that criticism just ties into the general thing of anybody in Rhaenyra's orbit gets uh lots of favor and anybody in Alicent's aura gets uh <laughs> lots of flack it act that does seem to be just the dynamic well and uh it's very clear what the purpose of the scene is as well because uh Jane says she hates feeling powerless and then uh Raina is like yeah me too and it's like Okay, every uh, single yeah. scene yep. we have with Reyna is, I want to have a dragon. Can I have a dragon? I want to have a dragon. I want to have a dragon. It's like, she's going to get a dragon. Yeah, I wonder what they're going to do with oh, her. Bit, yeah. Well, I mean, wouldn't That's it be subversive point. if she didn't? If, like, oh, if that'd she be fucking great. The dragon, that it didn't she work. She fucking eaten. Oh. I, uh, if, if I were able to control this in any way, shape, or form, I would absolutely have the sheep-eating, sheep-stealing dragon fucking kill her. That would be... I, a really like strong development at that point, there, right? Yeah, the idea that because like, we've seen constantly trying to pursue a dragon, it's like you assume that they're just playthings and that they're not. Yeah, like she wants it for power. Have their own. Yeah. Exactly, not because she's particularly invested in um the welfare of any given dragon. That's the thing. I got the like, sense with Aemond that he saw it as like this is about being a Targaryen to claim the greatest dragon, even from that age. Well, yeah, I'll be impressed to, with him for having done that because he did it. Compared to, for instance, the relationship that um, Rhaenys had with Maelys, or yeah. or even Aegon with uh, Sunfire, where it seemed like, oh, it's his pal, it's his friend, like his pet, you know, that he loves. Aemon feels very him. much like Alicent's view of a child doing as is expected of them, taken to the absolute extreme in that sense. To a point like, that makes her very uncomfortable. Yeah, everything, everything that he does is about his house and what is expected of him and his house and like meeting or exceeding those expectations in a way yeah and she doesn't like that even though that was exactly what she thought she needed to do oh, what she tried yes. to do she finds it quite horrifying because of where it leads with him and i just think it makes for an interesting set of story beats right to just get the message rain is dead and it'd be like what how and it's like she tried she tried to fucking claim a dragon and it killed her and, and like I could say, they're not really yeah. invested in doing anything else with the character. I know because, every fucking said, scene has been about it, so it's just like it feels like you're setting us up for the reverse if you want to make something interesting happen. But the idea that she would have died doing that when her she was entrusted with such an important role of defending the future generation of the house, you know, and like her selfishness mm -hmm. with the dragon. But I just I'm I'm sorry, I'm much more cynical, and I think well, the no, show what, is going to reward probably her happen is, with the um, dragon. She'll Absolutely. fly in. She'll fly in on the dragon. And be like, woohoo, yeah, I got a dragon, yeah. And I feel like turn the tide at some I, point. Yeah. yeah, I don't want that either. It's just it's think, rewarding whininess. Yeah, the, and the thing is, rags that will happen. So <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta accept, you gotta accept it. it. And then, 
And then <laughs> as like I'm supposed to be really happy for her. And I'm just like, oh, finally she got it. Hooray. I as an audience member, I'm really well, glad suppose, to see um, this. I suppose it's it's an interesting thing in terms of like I, I like seeing the dragons. I think they're really cool and everything. Um, but I mean I figure that an angle that the show has to explore, which it feels like it is doing, and to this point I wonder if it's incidental, like not on purpose, is the idea of whether or not it's even like fair or good that a bunch of people who just get to be able to have dragons, they therefore are in charge, even mm -hmm. if they don't particularly have the merit to justify being in charge. Like, that maybe it's better if, you know, the world is in a place where there are no dragons, and so it means that, like, people have to actually attain power, not just through, like, lineage, but through merit. Um, but I'm not even sure. I don't, I don't know if that's, like, a point, because the, the show very much is, like, Look at these dragons, woohoo, look at them get these dragons, specifically this one side of the conflict, even though it's presented as meant to be, like, pick a side, but I don't even know why that's part of the marketing when it seems like the show's perspective is that the blacks are the protagonists, in a sense. They Although, are, like, the, the with, team that you're meant to be rooting for. With saying, uh, we're talking about this when we haven't seen the latest episode, which very well could have her claiming the dragon successfully, or being eaten by it in a shocking turn of events. So right now, this is probably sounding pretty funny, this conversation. This uh, is speculation. Yeah, we so have no idea what the time. For all I know, she doesn't even have a scene in that episode. I have no idea. So mm -hmm. we're just saying what, what might happen, whatever. But um, Not clear. at the same time, I suppose that's part of the reason why these are recorded, too, is that uh, we get to have no... Because chat can be spoilery, okay? Chat, yeah, chat can do, like, chat the smirk, spoilers. you know? But be smirking or yeah some you guys in your smirkings mm -hmm. so anyway we're off to a masaria scene strap in oh uh, strap on uh, uh we haven't <laughs> gone to episode six <laughs> yet <laughs> so, um <laughs> she she's uh, rainier is ranting about how her council don't take her seriously and she says, uh, they speak around me, not to me. Um, they would make me queen, but they wish to keep me here, confined. And Misara's response to that is, they betray their own smallness. Instead of saying, well, no, if you die, then the whole cause is gone. Yeah, so, you're very important. It's, it's no, that such, might have something to do with it. just a sycophantic non-answer. Yeah, she, she just gasses anything. her up constantly. And it's like, why can't you actually say, say something insightful? Like, what were your it's suggestions? Well, Mahler, it's 2024, it, we call it love bombing. But wouldn't no, it be don't. interesting, the though, <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting if the angle that they had with it was that Rhaenyra actually noticed, it's like, what are you doing? Like, why do you just <laughs> keep saying that you think I want to hear? That it'll make yeah, me you're just being a yes man. man. I well, wonder if you That's the thing, it works. Rhaenyra's always yeah. like, ugh, oh, you're so nice, oh, you're so that's right. It really annoys me, like, are they it's fucking small? I barely know them. I yeah, don't well, know any of the black know they what are they supposed yeah. to do? Turn up and just go, you know what? Your indecisions are right. <laughs> like, go off, queen. Yeah. Oh, and just where's the, uh, <laughs> where's the consideration for their own problems that they have? You know, like they have their own houses, their own families, mm -hmm. and, and people who rely on them that are at risk because of the side that they've chosen. And what are you doing for them? I feel, it feels like, again, if the show is trying to make observations about like the way that this world works, that it has to. It has it has to like give that more attention. The idea that like should these people just like pledge everything, not only about themselves, but like everybody that they care about and their entire legacy to these people when they're not doing much for them in return? What did she this... do when the advice is just surrender were <laughs> fucked? <laughs> oh, that's the thing, right? Like she could just never be wrong. She can only be ignored or undermined, which I find very frustrating because this is the scene, by the way, where she says, you know. If I were born a man, I would have had a sword in my hand instead of a cup. Which bugs me, because arguably, the cup gave her more access to strategy than training with a sword would. Well, yeah, it's yep. knowledge, you know? Like, how often is Rhaenyra going to be in a position where she needs to fight someone, you know, with a exactly. sword, compared to being able to then, wage war and, and do tactics and right strategy? Yeah, yeah, the show doesn't time. understand that fighting and making war are not the same thing. Yeah. What bugs me is I feel like well, season I mean, one was more honest about her position too, because season two seems to be forgetting she was the heir for a vast portion of her life. She should have been looking into all of this shit, ready for when she was ruling. She didn't. She didn't care. Well, I the thing is, is that I thought that that was something that was being built up as a point of criticism of that character, that it was like one of the mistakes that she had made. 
in that she didn't take it as seriously as she should have, right? That was kind of a conflict in season one. Exactly. Allison in particular perceiving the idea that she didn't take anything seriously, she, she just did what she wanted. She's treating it as if it's the world that failed her, as though she couldn't make the decision. As if the series would have stopped her from reading about war. Especially well, if it was, like, histories of well, things, he'd be totally well, I mean, doing that. You know, well, something I mean, that we've seen um, later, not to, to be vague since we talk about it when it happens, but we see a character later in the season overcome um, the perceptions that stem from age, in this particular case, of being very young, to, like, instantly earning the favor and trust and approval of a whole bunch of other people through displaying intelligence and, and you know, employing strategy. Like, just doing things that are really clever. She could do the same thing. If she came along and was coming up with all of these great plans and great strategies, you know, like, <laughs> I figured that she'd be having a better time right now than what's what's presently happening, a, a massive amount of indecision and these insane decisions. Well, not to people be a... started on People started on lordly duties in the medieval period pretty early in their lives. Like, 15-year-olds being king and having to make those sorts of decisions without necessarily having a regent above them who can guide I mean, them in that sense. These scenes would work way better if Masaria was actually... An, an actual like useful advisor who who just would push her back on her every once in a while when she says shit like if I were a boy they would have given me a sword. It's like when you made air when you were like super young, did you not prep at all? And then she could be <laughs> like, uh... not... there were boys, you see. The, the show well, doesn't I... seem to want to call Rhaenyra out. Just I don't know. A little bit. I mean, uh, not to be a broken record, but where the fuck is Corlys? He's possibly the most yeah, insightful person she could have on her team, and she's not going yeah. to him. She's going to fucking Masaria. Well, I, I was actually going to say that, like, when she was in her cup-bearing years, even though they were basically at peace, they would still probably have, like, conflicts with, like, the triarchy and things like that. So she would have been sitting in on all those meetings where Corliss was talking about naval warfare. Well, that was the thing. She found it in season one insulting that she was made cup-bearer when she's the heir to the throne. It's like, why... But, We're in the council meetings all the time. It's annoying. It's like, what, what do you, you what do you expect to be made? All of the people on the council are there because they've earned their positions. You need to learn. You're young. It's uh, it's kind of just annoying to think about because yeah, she does in a scene to come begin to suggest and put forward that of course this is going to be her hand, but you should have been here the whole time and she should be pursuing him. You know she can trust him. They have a strong connection with the, you know, the, their houses being bound and Rhaenys' sacrifice being in a, a strong opener as well. And it's just, um, it's just annoying how long it takes her because she keeps, there's one in particular in episode seven where she'll, instead of doing anything smart, she'll just have a scene where she's suddenly talking to Masaria again. And it's like, whew. Oh uh, yeah, the flashback. Oh yeah, oh, the whiplash of, ugh, I remember, I know exactly the scene you're talking about. It yeah. annoys me. I think maybe it's also even possible that Alicent was a bit frustrated with Rhaenyra's mentality towards how seriously she'd take her, her airship when she's talking to Aegon about, like, do you think wearing that crown imbues you with wisdom? Might have been because once she was named heir, it's like, you, you didn't start taking anything more seriously. Yeah, it would be cool to have a single fucking character suggest something like that to Rhaenyra. Like, wow, you really think your opinions are just, you know, infinitely wise because you have the crown, that's all. What has uh, Corliss even been up to, by the way? Just uh, doing was, doing ship stuff, even though he's not actually been... Well, he, he, he was wounded. Is he just overseeing the blockade? Time. Well, but he's not wounded anymore, that's the point. And, yeah, uh, that's true. There's that, there's overseeing the blockade as a potential, but do you know that we've never seen him on a ship? Too. Yeah, I guess that's true. Really? In all it's of season one, oh god, we haven't. Never <laughs> seen him on a ship, which feels really weird. What a waste. Bit of an oversight, maybe. <laughs> Something is going on there, I don't know, but... Anyway, they... He's not on a ship at all in the battle where, where Damon kind of solos nope. the entire Well, charge. he wasn't on no. a ship in that battle. He fought them no, on the beaches. It? Huh? Mm-hmm. Anyway, Miss Arya is suggesting a plan, and we'll see the, uh, the fruits of that soon enough. In the meantime, um, she's got the Hand of the Kingpin in a little box... Giving it to Baylor to give. In it made I me think of terrible did. things, but oh, yeah. I think do, do most people even remember Echo happened? I don't know. They probably don't. They actually I'm a probably don't. Person and I didn't watch it. 
well, in any case, with uh, Rainey's dead, Baylor is now one of the most important members of the family because of her dragon being able to patrol and defend shit. Because Caraxes mm-hmm. is kind of off the map for now. And uh, yeah, she wants her to give the hand of the king to Corliss. And also, the, this conversation is relatively awkward because of the, the relationships here are kind of strained in an interesting way. If you remember... Corliss has a lot of reasons to not like Rhaenyra's side of the family. Remember, Rhaenys and Rhaenyra um, hated each other at one point. I mean, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, as, yeah, like that, as far as he knows and believes and speculates, Rhaenyra was responsible for, uh, it was Lainor, right? Yeah, yeah. certainly complicit yeah, somewhat in whatever happened there. Because they yeah. got married straight away. <laughs> it's like, hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's just the general bitterness that he believes that essentially Rhaenyra is uh, what Rhaenys should have had. Like, the position that she should have had, that she got passed over. So there's a bit of resentment there as well. Yes. Which takes us to another Harren Hall spooky mansion scene with uh, good old Damon, where he's fucking his mother. Yes! Yeah, that was quite the Fuck reveal. that of the mom! Well, of him. I'd like to start with saying that this scene was quite reviled online. I was surprised. There was many posts. I sent lots of them to Fringy because I was like, what's going on here? People were outraged. They were like, what is this disgusting filth? And I'm talking about Hot D fans, like, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire (laughs) fans being like, there was a post that said George R. Mine would never have written filth like this. Most of the Targaryens on this show are currently yeah, married sure. to family members. George would never. George would never, yes. Not George. That's insane. That's, that's an sweet, insane sweet take. George. <laughs> Have we ever read any of George's work? I yeah. thought it was bizarre. And, uh, you can't read what hasn't been written. A big well, portion of so. the complaints so. related to the assumption that Damon like, wanted this, but it's very clear in the vision. He did not know this was his mum. It's a classic misunderstanding. When she says, my son or whatever, he's like, what the fuck? And then he sees Simon in the dream, which is probably not his preference. Can't confirm. That's my preference. <laughs> I want him in all my dreams where I fuck my mom. <laughs> he gives off a pretty strong impression. He's not happy. And there's blood on his hands again. So I don't, I don't think the show was trying to say this scene is... Is good and fine. <laughs> I think it's actually yeah, sure not good I, I and think fine. The whole point of all of the Harren Hall scenes is meant to be this is not good. Yeah, maybe don't yeah. fuck your mom. I don't know well, why this can't be t- interpreted as just demonstrative of his twisted psychology rather than an endorsement of yeah. incest. Right? Like any time that, that Damon, what it was. anytime that, I think that's a problem though, is that any time the show says you know Damon's a bit fucked up, people are like wait, what are you talking about? It's like what are you He's what are you talking about? Like. What are you talking about? <laughs> You know, like so, it's actually. I, the, I, I think that might be something to do with it. The dialogue from the mum is, "You are always the strong one, the best swordsman, the fearless dragon writer. Writer, your brother had great love in his heart, but he lacked your constitution. He was unsuited for the crown, but you, you were made to wear it. If only you'd been born first. It's basically just full and unfiltered praise of how amazing Damon is in his own head." And how much better he is than his brother. And then, uh, intertwined with him realizing he's fucking his own mum, you might even imagine it's like a really gross way of trying to describe how almost incestuous his own vanity is. Like, he constantly just, it's like cyclical. He's just so obsessed with himself. He's the best. He, nothing can stop him. He's unironically just the fucking god of men sort of thing, which is a huge problem that he's had to deal with. And, um... To the point where it like prevented him from taking care of his brother, which is completely antithetical to his goal of making House Targaryen strong, right? Like it, it, he's a, this is why he's such a fascinating character. They've done immense work for him, and to make that scene so uncomfortable while repeating over and over again just how amazing he is to himself. Like, what do you think the point of it was? Yeah, do you think the That's showrunners, the people who made that show, didn't think you know what? It's a little <laughs> uncomfortable to fuck yeah. your mom. Little awkward. I think uh, this um, part would maybe it's you know worth talking about that in general it seems like there's a lot of discontent around the Harren Hall subplot in general. Yes, um, I think we must have talked about it at some point last time as well, but it'll it'll continue because yes, he's from episodes three till presumably seven. I don't know if it's going further than that. He's been 
rummaging around Luigi's mansion, as it's lovingly referred to, having <laughs> nightmares. Um, yeah, I was just about to say, like, if the context Simon's wasn't mansion. obvious enough, this is all happening in Luigi's mansion. It might give you a clue as to, like, <laughs> this is, like, good things don't happen here. We don't see and hear good things. Well, so the, the complaint would be, I want to see him doing more action man stuff, doing things like getting out there and flying his dragon, and attacking people. I don't want to see him, I don't want to see him struggling with his own psyche. I don't want to see him fucking his own mom. <laughs> Maybe that's Which I fair, do, but... but I don't make the decisions around here. I think what I, exactly what I want from a character with as complicated of a self-image as Damon is a lot of time spent with that self-image. I just uh, this to me to some extent feels like the perfect thing to do with this character. Um, I yeah. agree, one hundred percent. We have really he's been forced to look in that very horrifying mirror for a while this season, and it's going to change a lot about him from what we can gather. I would say. Yeah, um, his outlook on a on a viscerousless world is important to who he is. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes, uh, generally just spending the scene. You have uh, Simon Strong saying, is the duck not Hello, to your Simon. liking? There's also Goose, which I thought was interesting because in season one they, they used duck and goose to refer to straight and gay. Like, uh, oh, yeah. With more subtlety, I wonder if that was. Oh yeah, on the beach. Oh, I figured yeah, it was something were... to do with uh, just duck, duck, goose. But duck is a um. What? D duck is a. You're not what? familiar what? with duck, duck, goose? duck, duck, goose? No, I'm not familiar with why it would be in House of the Dragon. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> they start right. playing it at the table. <laughs> All right, duck, duck, goose, David everybody, everybody, sit around. The sword. <laughs> Classic Westeros well, schoolyard. I game. am no goose. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, that's good. The uh, the part oh, of this is... I, I just meant like in terms of a kind of like how the Oscar and Grover, right? Like that there might that there are just like little references to no, modern to day. Houses. Okay, I don't well, know if you remember, I, well, but no, so in saying... in season one, when Rhaenyra and Lena are talking to each other about their preferences, she says some people like duck, some people like goose, and the reason they're saying it that way is because they can't be open about the fact that he's gay, right? Um, the problem so, is we both like Duck. Yes, and so then they're, they're clear on the fact that they're probably going to have problems with their relationship, but then she says, you know, hey, you can you can do things for Duck, but also maybe you do Goose every once in a while. Everyone likes different variety in their meals or some bullshit yeah, like that. Yeah, as long as you give me a good Goose in now and then. Mm-hmm, which he didn't, apparently, and it destroyed the whole kingdom, so how about that? Apparently Goose I mean, makes yeah. really good toilet paper, from what I heard. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we got a pretty great set of little Simon Strong moments here, as always. Uh, one of my favorites is when Damon gets up to leave, and obviously they're all supposed to stand, and his, I assume, kids are all still eating, and he's like, get up, 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 up. they're all yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> um, and then he says, uh, you know, very well, your grace, and he says, you should address me as my king, and he's like, but you're the prince. And he says, what would you call the husband of the queen? And he has, this is probably my favorite Simon moment. He says, well, yeah, the great. king. He goes, ah, oh, there it is then. Consort. Consort. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dude, he's so cheeky. I love it. I he's love great. Simon. <laughs> he seems quite happy with himself, demeanor. too. <laughs> His mild demeanor is just letting him get away with shit, almost. Boy, yeah. yeah, which is funny because I think he's brilliantly subtle with it. However, he's dealing with someone who is actively losing their mind, so he might want to be careful. Yeah. Somewhat, maybe. But, uh, yeah, the actor's been doing a great job. He's uh, he's a lot of people's sort of, like, standout secondary character, because he's in enough of it to be considered, like, he's had some strong screen time, in a good way. He has. Yeah, he has. And has I'm some, glad for it. strong screen time. He is an excellent foil to Damon. Absolutely. Damon, yeah. I mean, that's... That's the reason why I wholeheartedly disagree with the idea that Harren Hall is too slow or a waste of time or anything like that. It's it's the yeah, perfect it's place good. to put a character like Damon. He is absolutely he is so thoroughly uncomfortable in that place. I don't know how else to describe what we're getting here is a great performance filled with nuance and micro expressions and conflict with someone who it's like having a fucking dragon with a teddy bear is the, the to the team up. 
and and yeah, one of them yeah. is aware of the other very much so but tolerates them all the same for the sake of whatever's going to be happening later but also the, the teddy bear the teddy bear has um he he is uh invulnerable to the debuff of luigi's mansion yes so <laughs> <laughs> he's aware of the mansion's power immune to fear yeah and then yeah we get to learn That's right. definitively the kind of things that damon thinks about and the kind of things that he's having to wrestle through I don't know why that wouldn't be extremely valuable. Maybe it will be seen as valuable retros retroactively. Once we're through it, people will be like, oh, you know what? That was actually a lot worth... It's certainly by the time we see more of him in presumably season three. I don't know if he's going to die in the last episode again. We haven't seen it. But I assume not. But then again, I don't know. Because this universe kills people very quickly, very randomly sometimes. So, mm. Just saying. Now, As long as it's not Simon. Uh, yeah, I know, he should live forever. Maybe he's not even real. Maybe he's the god of this universe. Ooh. Ooh, maybe. Maybe he's George R. R. Martin's self-insert. Yeah. He's writing a book in universe, but, um, yeah, Harren Hall needs to be repaired, and they need money, and Damon essentially promises it himself. Um, see how that goes, I suppose. And, uh, yeah, the, the question of how to refer to him, it just pushes further the the question the audience has as to what Damon's goals here are. Um, what is he doing? And Rhaenyra has that same sort of worry about him. And I think what we're coming to learn is he has that worry about himself. He's not sure. But um, he's not yeah. feeling he's not feeling your grace anymore. He's feeling my king. And of course Simon's like, well mm. I mean <laughs> like unless unless you're Might not loyal to Rhaenyra. Simply loyal to Rings yourself. has a lot of compensation for what's going on in his own head at this point. Yeah. Anyway, over to the Green Council. We're comboing up on uh, on great scenes, you see, one by one. That's so, right. Yeah, but uh, All While has like a, an assessment of uh, Aegon. They're not sure if he's going to make it. And uh, we have the sort of we have to figure out what's going to happen now because. Um, we need, you know, actions to be taken. And a regency will assure the people of stability in the crown. So, does Alicent have a candidate in mind to take over until Aegon either passes or is recovered? And she suggests herself. You can only imagine how well this is going to go. Um, I think what is so interesting about the scene is just, uh, again... Uh, Olivia Cook's such a great actress in this. Her gradually realizing the entire table doesn't really have much interest or respect for her. Um, which is not entirely yeah. what she was expecting at all. It, well, it seems like she was totally blindsided by it and then has a very uh, 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 simultaneously subdued yet intense uh, reaction to the realization of her standing in, in uh, the world. Yeah, and she's she's like, you know, I, I did it for a long time. I've uh you know done this, done that, and then uh the, the, she'll like she'll like say, Oh yeah, uh, when when Viserys was ill, I, I practically ran the kingdom and then Ironrod or whatever character will be like, Yes, you uh you did a good job in a time of peace. And and, and it's just these these yeah. little lines that are like undermining her position and then gradually realizing nobody is actually putting forth much of an argument for her well, at all. I suppose the interesting one is that the maester says, like, well, you know, she did it before, she could do it again. Um, <laughs> yeah, the like maester the seems to be the only yeah. one, which was a surprise, probably, because she was expecting the two main people to support two. her would be Laris and Cole, but neither do. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, and it's, uh, it's, it's just, um, I mean, something that she should have realized, which is that it, it's the point that, um, it's the point that Laris makes, which is, well, I mean, part of the the whole idea of challenging Rhaenyra's claim is the idea that she's a woman. So what would it mean if they put Allison in charge? Like, she should have realized which team she picked, you know? And, like, what that meant for uh, ever being able to lead. Also, Laris has his fingers in a lot of, uh, in a lot of places right now, not just oh, yeah. you. He, um... well, that's, that's what she's realizing in that moment, I think, is like, oh, yeah, Laris isn't really loyal to me. <laughs> like, that's not... He's got his He's own not agenda. my illicit confidant. He's playing just about anyone. Yeah, Laris is looking at the menu. <laughs> He's like, what have mm -hmm. we got here? What can I make use of? And uh, 
he describes something that uh, Eamon says as very wise, and he opts for Eamon to be sort of promoted. So it's just funny because uh, we've seen, you know, enough, like two episodes further than this. We know something that happens between Laris and Eamon. It's very interesting to watch his first interactions when Eamon is clearly about to rise to significant power that Laris has already, you know, taking his opportunities where he can to be like, you're great. You're so great. You're awesome. Yes, 100% yeah. you. Um, Something I really like about the scene is the way that it's shot in terms of, um, and, and like that, uh, and, and combined with the fact that, um, Eamon doesn't say anything until they all decide that he's in charge, which is really cool. He just allows the conversation mm -hmm. to play out naturally. But it's like the, they shoot it from, um, essentially him sitting at the head of the table, but obviously on the other side. And then, and then you have like the, the sort of shot from the side showing him walking from the one side of the table to the other. And it feels like it's all kind of highlighting how it's, it, it was like totally arbitrary where he was sitting. He was in charge. He was already in charge. Um, and it was just making it official, which is really cool. There's also, there's another beat where Alice, and he says she's referring to Aegon recovering, like whether he, when he recovers or does not. And then there's a shot dedicated to um, Aemond giving a look. And then it racks focus to... Um, uh, what's his name? The Whispers guy, seeing Laris. a wise strategy. Laris. Laris. Yeah, Laris. Laris, yeah, yeah. And it's just, I think that, like, they set up that one shot just for that one little beat, and it's just it speaks volumes without any dialogue. It's just another example yeah, it of how Laris in to. Yeah, yeah, this it's an excellently directed show. Oh well, I suppose like the... every single beat. Yeah, the gem of the scene. For a lot of people, would just be the fact that uh, Eamon moves into position and goes from being silent to just machine gunning out uh, yeah. orders and interests. Them all working pretty fast and efficiently, having orders to give, and the whole time the camera just slowly tightens up on Allison, just mm -hmm. having she yeah. can't do a single fucking thing. Eamon was just waiting for the very, green light. A very good. I don't know, like what way to describe the expression, but just the wide-eyed like terror. She, I don't know what kind of expression, like what exactly it's called, but she's really good at doing that. I'm <laughs> just like looking like her soul is deeply just, like, uncomfortable. Ready. She's great, sort yeah. of. Uh... Got a strong. She might even be having a panic attack. I'm not actually 100 percent sure because her whole life has just been uprooted. She has no power. She was the star which, of the original Ouija, which uh, I suppose is interesting as well, given that um in the prior episode that was her base. You know, she was essentially trying to exercise her power over. Aegon, not like in any official capacity, um, just being like, shut up, do what you're told, you know, that's all you're good for, to then in the very next episode be put in a situation of like, yeah, cool, bro, anyway, just sit aside while everybody else talks business. Yeah, I read it as a mixture of just being incensed and also like devastated that yeah. you, your, your, your presence there is almost meaningless, despite oh, her title and everything. She was wholly outmaneuvered. Um, yep. She she got yeah. uh, completely outmaneuvered by her own son. Yeah. On the uh, suggestion that the gates will be closed when rumors are spreading that people are starving in the city, and then her reaction to that doesn't seem to be very positive at all. Which is another nope. interesting thing, because apparently she closes the gates in the books. Uh, or at least that's what's said in the source, because I saw uh, Gary brought this up and there's was, there was, there was some complaints about this that switched it to Amond when, uh, funnily enough, when Gary brought it up, he said it was a change that made nothing but sense, because why would she be able to command that at this point? And then, of course, having him command that the gates be sealed so that word of the suffering of the people in King's Landing is going to be harder to get out is kind of more of an Amond move, IMO? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And uh, I mm -hmm. like that we get to enjoy her seeing that happen in real time, and I get the impression from her that she's like, holy fuck, what a monster move. And then she has to be like, why... was this me? Did I do this? Did I make him, you know? Mm -hmm. Which uh, she's gonna have to reckon with as time goes on. Hence why, I, I don't know if anyone has noticed, we've already talked about it, but Alicent is just the clear winner for us in terms of discussing the... The journey of a character compared to Rhaenyra, which I want to let you guys know, that is the complete opposite online. People find Rhaenyra uh, is yeah, the best character, wrong. and that Alicent sucks. Out. I'm going to go further than hate. Uh, a lot of people, 
quite frankly. A lot of people have started to say it's not just that they hate Allison, but that she has nothing going on. There's no story there. Um, I mean, I'd Wrong. say that the art is like pretty phenomenal in terms of writing thematically. Uh, uh, like the 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 from where she began to where she is now is such a massive transformation. Um, and it's so massive that you might not even realize how gradually it was mm -hmm. developed and built up over the course of the whole show from season one into season two. She's a really fascinating character. Like, I do find it insane how little, you know, I, I guess, yeah, because like, if you hate her, that's, you know, you can hate characters that you still think are uh, well written. Um, but it, it, I mean, I guess it's like you said, right? People don't even think that she's particularly well written. We just have to be honest here. Just about everyone present in the show is quite despicable. Sure. Well, it's the whole, uh, it's the, the Reese Fonz quote, right? Yeah. <laughs> they all suck. It's just correct. And to, I really enjoy be... the scene as Alison, like, her last attempt at having a hand on the wheel, I guess. Yeah. Especially considering where things go in, I guess, the most recent episode at this point in time. When, um... Uh, the, the one of the most important Allison scenes for me will be in episode eight of season one, which also just happens to be the best anyway. But when she's dealing with um, the girl who's gotten raped by Aegon, because she's practically become her father in that scene, and she's uh, mm -hmm. no less hypocritical than what she claimed of Rhaenyra, but she's also just horrifyingly efficient and cruel. But then you get the little glimpse of humanity where she tries to comfort the girl who's basically breaking down crying. And realizing just how much of, you know, this world just breaks people like them. Like obviously, it's broken her well long ago. But she also had immense power at that point. That was arguably the height of her power. Her and her father basically controlled everything. Um, but now, now it's all gone. And it's been interesting to watch. So next up, we get, uh, we get a hue scene. They're hungry. Any uh, any any yep. comments for anybody here? <laughs> well, I'm thinking um, he he. Do you think that he could have played an alternate universe Geralt of Rivia? Maybe. Maybe. Definitely don't yeah, right. uh, dislike the actor. The only thing about Hugh scenes, Ulf scenes, and Alan and Adam scenes is that they've been a tad one dimensional. Um, and, kind of. You know, I think for a show as good as. House the Dragon, you kind of want them to do better than that, but you're like, okay, uh, I guess, you know, those pieces, they're just sitting on the board and they're waiting to be put in, and we know now exactly where they're going, it's just that uh, it almost creates this awkward thing, we'll probably talk about it when we get to episode 7, but th th they all end up in a place and it's like, well, those guys are going to have stuff happen to them because they're the only ones that had scenes before this. <laughs> That's just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um... Then we get a particularly uh, uh, interesting scene, IMO, one of my probably favorites of the episode. It's Cole is seeing to the um, the rat catchers being cut down, and Allison wants to have a chat with him about what's uh, what's been going on. She's not happy. She says, uh, I guess you're seeing faithfully to the Prince Regent's commands, and obviously ignoring the, the, the just... I guess the preamble of it, he just says, uh, Aemon is next in line. It is the order of things. And um, she says, you know what he is, what he has somehow become. Somehow. How did this happen? Such a, such a great little know. line I'm because... I'm just his mother. <laughs> How uh, could this have happened? We already know that she's soon to realize that it's actually her fault, but I, I like this denial from her to be like, we both know he's a demon at no fault of my own. <laughs> it's like, your kid? I, I guess so. Had nothing to do with you at all. Um... And she says, has your loyalty faded, or does it flourish only at night and flee the sunrise like a moth? Which is so interesting to say to him when every time she uses him for that, it like completely fucks up the entire promise he has in relation to it, like the honor of the king's guard that he's supposed to fulfill. You know, arguably both using each other, right, to, f to forget the all of the sins and pain that they've got in general in their lives, but to use it against him as though you're sleeping with me, so you should be supporting me in the council scenes, even if I'm wrong. Women. Uh, give him one thing. Um, but I, I like the scene, because she's so obviously the bad guy. She says, um, you know, all this shit to him, and he says, but what I saw at Rook's rest, and she cuts him off to say, what? What did you see? 
It's like, woman... <laughs> what do you, you think he saw? You already like, know. Okay. Like it's 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 amazing just how much she's in her own head sometimes. And I like I, said, I like Allison. I think she's a very interesting character. But to have known, he's already said to her, "You lost nine hundred men." I guess she hasn't entertained the idea that he actually cares about his men. Uh, it's a lot of people witnessing that level of yeah. death. Obviously, watching his king get what happened to him. Uh, the amount of campaigns he's already ran through each of these castles. What a great job he's done. And then to hear him say, you know, I saw something that changed my mind. She's like, oh, what did you see then? Go on. And, Those um, 900 men were all killed in an instant by one weapon. It's like, well, oh, okay. That yeah, and arguably the chaotic <laughs> clashing of two weapons that clearly didn't give a shit about the men below, which is the uh, mm -hmm. inevitability. Because they weren't even killed a lot of those men as a reaction to just warfare. It was just, they were just getting killed casually while the dragons fought each other. Getting yeah. stood on and shit. Um, but yeah, he has, a, he has a line in response to that where he says, their armor melted. And uh, the actor, I, I'm not, I think it's something Fabian, right? I, I, I'm not 100% I'm not sure I'd have to check, but he, uh, he shakes on delivering it. And uh, he does a really good job of convincing me that it's it's the it truly is what he's been talking about that he cares about the most that it's completely shaken his whole point of view and his future actions, and she's not happy about that, right? But she's not respecting the experience that he's had. Yeah, and like that he he probably has just unbelievable PTSD from that battle, and for as ready very as a man good can, reason. Yeah, as ready as a man can be for war, which isn't even necessarily that ready that sort of a war, uh, I don't think anyone in all the kingdoms could be properly prepared to go into. Yeah, and I think, um, having exposed himself to all of that, like, his, his, the petty shit with him, Allison, and different people power playing on the council is almost nothing anymore. Like, that, that could be dealt with, maybe, if war is over, and the way he sees it is to make war end Existence. as fast as possible, we need to get brutal decisions done quickly, and Aemond is gonna be the man for the job. It's, uh, he pretty much says to, which uh, is, again, such a good scene, because it's so quick, but they achieve so much. Um, when she says, uh, and what of justice, of temperance, or is strength now our only god, so you cast me aside? And he says, have I not spared you? Because he doesn't want her to have yeah. to make a lot of the fucking decisions that are going to have to be made that probably involve burning innocent people. Yeah, not a pleasant, uh, not a pleasant thing to, it's not a position that you want to put someone in. Um, it is doing them a kindness in a way. And I think that there really is how Cole sees it because Cole is, he's seen the really bad stuff that Alicent just hasn't seen. Um, so he's been, I think he's being very earnest here, but he's not given a, he's not treated fairly for that by her. No. And he says, will you preside over this? Um, is that who you are, Alison? And she says, I didn't ask to be spared and I didn't give you leave to speak my name. And, uh, I think I've... Kicking I, him when he's down. Well, I, I mentioned this to Rags, because uh, I can't remember where I saw the take, but um, it was described as, like, misogynistic, that he's not even respecting her role. Oh, when I was, yeah. And I was like, this isn't even... No, that's, what's happening I here is he's a, appealing to her as two human beings. A human, yeah. The, she's like being the, very the... disrespectful of him. She's just like, no, 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 you're not, you're not on my level. Well, you don't yeah, he's to trying me. to say the etiquette doesn't matter, the ranks and roles doesn't matter, the kingdom, the royalty, whatever. It's literally just, you shouldn't have to go through this. Someone has to. We need this to end. It's horrible. And if and we she, lose, we die. She's barely listening to him and instead responds with, hey, you will refer to me as your grace or whatever. Fuck. And it's just like... Um... Well, it's, it's just showing a massive disconnect that was already kind of present at earlier parts of the conversation, right? It's like, she's not even, she, she's like not thinking about it. She doesn't know, like she doesn't actually know or care to know about like what is really happening. Um, well, yeah. She's kind of existing in a world of abstractions rather than the reality of, of people are dying horribly to dragons fighting each other. We get a really good scene of her realizing just how much she's been, like, fucked over in court. But then you get a scene that kind of argues, Allison, who gives a fuck? Like, thousands of people are dying. We got, we, like, we got to yeah. sort this out. Who cares if you have the rank or role you want in court? That, that doesn't matter. 
Uh, and, and yeah, having Cole try to explain this to her, that his whole life has been rocked from top to bottom by witnessing suffering of like a thousand men. And the fact that all she's annoyed at is that he didn't support her, uh, which, by the way, even if he did, it probably wouldn't have gotten her the role. Absolutely not. It would have drawn it out a lot, too, because he's hand. Yeah, and it, it, it's just... And yeah, she's, she's having trouble. She's not quite seeing clearly, but uh, maybe she will in scenes to come. Who knows? Uh, so the gates have closed. OMG. Not looking good. OMG. And uh, Hugh specifically getting very mad. He was almost out, but uh, yeah, no getting out now. Which takes us to the next scene, which is good old Jace treating with the phrase at the twins. Which, um, I mean, I, I love the look of the place. I enjoyed the performances from the two characters. I don't have a huge amount to say. It's just, it's a pretty normal conversation about a back and forth of leverage. Whether or not yeah. they would, you know with him or the other team and it's played very carefully as most houses would of, of like who are you loyal to and it's like well you know whose dragon is coming to visit me soon i don't know uh just putting it out there but they he makes a deal he's going to give them harren hall if they agree to support or rather open the bridge to the north men and support rhaenyra which uh, was a good i'd just love to see i'd love to see more of jace in this sort of role because he's as he bemoans himself, he's been doing a lot of sitting around, almost. So we haven't been able to see him in action as much as I might have liked. Not that that's necessarily a criticism, as I'm sure that's on its way, but... Yeah, I mean, he. this was the first attempt he actually did, because he gets scolded for this, doesn't he? And she's like, you did yep. a thing without... L tell, let me tell you to do it, boo. Which, you know... But, uh, yeah, it'll be good progress. We'll see how, how that goes. Yeah, and I wonder how this will um, kind of interface with what, you know, Damon is doing. And what, what does Damon want with Heron Hall himself, maybe afterwards? Or uh, does he have plans for it in the long term, specifically? Or we, we, who knows? Who knows, indeed. Speaking of yeah. Damon, back over to Luigi's mansion. Having some fun, oh, rebuilding, chopping great. some wood, building ladders, getting some work done and dusted. Though, as Damon's wicked. Do you remember you the just... ladder? Do you mm -hmm. remember the ladder in Rings of Power? That was one piece of wood, a single piece of wood. Oh, I think that? I know what you're talking about. Yeah, in the tower, yeah, right? In the elven, yeah. Uh, they, at... they just, like, Dude, I'm not the ready. Into a log? The watchtower. I'm yeah. not ready for Rings of Power Season 2. I need more time to recover that... from the acolyte. I know. But it's I didn't almost see that, here. But that's hilarious. Yeah. It, it's a sink. I can't that... believe that they had a ladder that was a piece of wood. <laughs> it was all carved from a single piece. Oh, I mean, I that guess, like, is, a it, is it a spell, maybe? That just someone turned it no, into a ladder? No, it's just good elven craftsmanship, <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, what a anyway, as, uh, as he's cutting some wood, he starts hearing screams, as you do. Ah, um, well, that's what happens when I cut people. I, I mean, yeah. In retrospect, we understand that these are the screams, likely, of all the uh, innocent people suffering and dying thanks to his orders to Willem Blackwood. Uh, which is kind of just... I, I don't have a better word for this right now that feels more appropriate, even though it's totally inappropriate. Fun! That Harren Hall does this to people. Like, uh, then again, it could just be specifically Alice Rivers, or both. But, you know, it was a pretty horrendous decision he made, and now he gets to sort of experience it somewhat in a way that's much more tangible than nothing at all. Or rather, you know, someone saying, yeah, we killed a bunch of people. Just hearing Aaron screaming. Hall gives me the um, similar energy to the cave on Dagobah, where hmm. it is sort of like, it it brings out what's already in you. You know, only what, only you, what take you take with you. It. You know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. It's that's, Heron Hall gives me that kind of idea where it's, it might be very different for different people, but because a lot of people haven't done all the crazy stuff that Damon is and aren't crazy like Damon can often be, then they don't get the effects of it. Whereas because Damon is a very particular individual who's very, very much um, violent and uh, opportunistic and has done a lot of crazy stuff. It's like super highly good complex super psychologically, dude. He's got a lot going on. Yeah. And Heron Hall's like, ooh, we're eating good while you're here. We're going to oh, make yeah. you fuck your mom. 
<laughs> Yo, we, haven't been, like, we haven't we haven't been able to do that in a while and boy are we excited <laughs> he's a compressed Ooh, file and heron hall is like winrar unzips him yeah. <laughs> we're um, installing we're installing the incest mod he has, <laughs> he has a bit of a back and forth with old Alice Rivers, and once again, more open with her in this conversation than he usually is with literally anybody else. I uh, always find that of interest. Again, haven't seen episode 8, don't know if they've revealed anything about Alice yet, but still, I feel like there's something real, real spooky going on with her, as opposed to her just being there. I just doubt that. Could be though. Um, oh, they're giving her way too much attention and references and stuff. I, it, it's got, there's definitely something going on. Might not be revealed in the last episode. Maybe they keep it going for a bit longer. But I uh, maybe I certainly I hope for some kind of uh, some kind of closure on certain story elements for Damon here in Harren Hall by the time we hit the last episode. We shall see, and we shall talk about it when we get there. For now, though, uh, he's. She's kind of criticizing him for the decision to do what he's done, and you keep hearing the screams coming back and forth in the background. Um, and she says tactics like that, they're not even things that would necessarily ultimately work because it's going to make everyone fucking hate you. And uh, what if what if it ends up killing you? And then he's like, well, whatever, I'll be dead. It's a very um, interesting point of view. <laughs> it's just like the strategy, either I win or I die, which is also... In a way, a win, because I don't have to do anything anymore. I think he even says, like, <laughs> I wouldn't have to put up with all this shit anymore. Um, but yes, uh, he's... He kind of, like, gets a bit aggressive with her and basically admits that he's interested in taking the throne himself and that Rhaenyra can join him as queen if she so wishes. So, is that something he's actually going to do or is he kind of blowing smoke right now? But um, it's it's obviously the conflict he's experiencing as to whether or not that's his final goal. And um, the manner in which he's trying to achieve it right now is being warned against him as a pretty bad move. Um, you know, it's all but said that he's made a huge mistake with what he's done with the Brackens. Um, yes. But one of the most interesting parts for me was... Simon walking in, not acknowledging Alice verbally, looking at her a bit strangely, almost as though she's not actually even there. And when mm. he crosses in front of her and starts swaying back and forth, you can't see her anymore. As though she just disappeared out of thin air. Interesting. Well, mm -hmm. the, the most interesting thing to me about it is that a lot of people cited this as proof that she's definitely there, while I was like, ooh... That's yeah. like my favorite kind of thing where they actually manage to misdirect you that hard. If they are, I could be wrong. On a casual viewing, one might come away with that impression, but I think after watching it multiple times, I am, uh, I don't, I think something, uh, I, I don't know. I think Alice is maybe, uh, just the way Simon does his look, you know, it's it's curious. Yeah, how he kind of looks past her, not at her, doesn't mention, you know, doesn't say anything to her. Oh, and she also oh. says, it's a pity, don't you think, that you never knew your mother? Which is a very spooky thing to say to him after a certain dream he had. And again, well, with the... she mean knew her biblically. And then with the way that he speaks to her, like, he's going to speak to her again. He's not going to be bringing any of this up. It always feels like a full reset, and he treats her as though she's absolutely a normal person, despite the fact that she always says really fucking wacky shit to him. Almost yeah. as though she's in his head. Maybe. she's She's got the big whack going on, and something yes. right. She's not a normal lady. Normal women, they're, they're not quite like that. Mm. He's playing with her in the way I don't know that he would be with a real person treating him the way she does. It's all she very gets interesting away to with about. it, yeah. yeah. They do a very odd thing with the blocking of her when she walks away. Um, yes, they do. Behind Simon. Where she, you don't, like, she sort of disappears behind Simon in the foreground, but then you don't see her pass the other side of him. That's an so excellent it is observation. Suggesting, it's suggesting that she's an apparition or something. Or, like, obviously just in his head. Who can truly say, next up, we have Corliss talking to Baylor in what I think is quite a really strong, good scene. I quite like my Corliss scenes. He says that, um, like she, she tells him that he's been offered the role of Hand of the King. And, uh, 
he doesn't take it well at first. He says, you know, uh, even the death of my wife does not content her. Has she not asked enough of my house? Seeing it as strictly like a fucking hell, I have to do even more for Rhaenyra. And then he says, or does she think the position will compensate me for my loss? Basically, he's not in a good mood, um, as you can imagine, because of the whole Rhaenys thing. He quite liked her. Yeah. And uh, Baylor does a really good job of explaining just how important this role is, how it matters to their whole family, how he's been working his ass off to rise up all of the power of all of them, and that this would be the absolutely correct decision to make. And as an alternative, he can go fucking join the Greens if he wants, which is obviously a nightmare scenario at this point. Um, she says all this shit to him, and it's, it's pretty convincing, and I find that it's probably... It was important that he did hear it from her. She, she inspires him with like his own story of what he did in his life and why. And then he um, he's inspired enough that he offers her the role of being the heir to Driftmark. And uh, we already know from earlier scenes that he didn't really want her as the heir because she just she doesn't care about ships. She doesn't know much about the sea. And what's cool is that's her response essentially. She says she's fire and blood. She's not salt and sea, which is just yeah, not suitable. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's a good line. It's not me. It's it's not what I'm about. I'm not a salty sea lass. Tis... Although, I mean, a dragon would oh, defend Driftmark pretty well. Well, you can do that anyway, right? <laughs> you can yeah, visit everyone once in a while, have a little look-see. Um, yes. Strong scene. Then we get, yeah, really uh, like it. Rhaenyra is sending Sir Alfred off to meet with Daemon. And uh, there's another scene I find curious, because he's, he's one of the more outspoken members of the council, and he says, like, are you just removing me? Is that the idea? And she says, well, your loyalty is unquestioned. Like, family lines, he's never going to align with the High Towers. And he says, not while I live. And she says that you got that, and the fact that he is outspoken enough that he could probably be able to, you know, deal with Damon. Go against Damon, yeah. Um, and that um, it's, it's important work, it needs to be done, sort of thing. But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if she is choosing him because he's outspoken, which, genuinely speaking, I hope that isn't actually a part of the decision at all. I really do, because it's like... Yeah, it's I just... hope not either. I don't think so. I think she's being earnest in what she's saying. Um, but if it comes to be that that isn't the case, I will be disappointed, and Rhaenyra will continue to annoy me. Yeah, and she fucking drops useful voices like flies. <laughs> and she'll pick up useless ones. Or, you know, hype generator ones, which are useless in a sense. Um, but anyway, it would be interesting to see what a, I don't know, what conversation with Damon would look like with this guy. But we don't see it in episode 6 or 7, I don't think. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe an 8. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's the hour of the, I think, the, the wolf. Wolf? Yeah, and um, the wolf. I find I, the, the, like I said, the comedy in the show is rare, but I love it when it happens. Uh, David is woken up by Simon at the hour of the wolf, and he just goes, "What is it, Sir Simon? Is the pudding served?" <laughs> Which is such a <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, what has happened instead is consequences have arrived. The work that was done. <gasps> by Willem Blackwood to the Brackens has pissed off all the Riverlords because it's gross and unseemly and horrible and they all kind of rip into him for it. He's tired from not sleeping, sleeping, having nightmares, being confused, having no real power that he can properly use here that he usually can, trying to repair a broken fucking castle, dealing with his ever-changing values and trying to understand himself, getting trolled by Simon and Alice. And now he's got an army of river lords basically telling him he's the worst piece of shit ever. And they even cite to him that he uh, had a baby killed in its mother's arms. Obviously referencing episode one. And he like he just doesn't take it well. He, he like starts to lose his composure and uh, just wants to be left alone, sort of thing. Like Damon is fucking under a hell of a lot of weight, and he's clearly made some mistakes. And they basically say, "We don't fucking like you." I think they say, "Know this." Uh, yeah, Interloper. The Riverlands are an ancient place, watched closely by the eyes of the old gods and new, and dragon or no, we shall not raise our banners for a tyrant. Which is like the Great opposite taste. of what he's after. <laughs> you know? Poor guy. You can't, uh, you can't, when it comes to earnest loyalty and admiration, you can't force that. 
as he is, uh, yeah, as he is learning. And to yeah, go and kill a bunch of women and children and destroy temples and shit is just yeah. piss them all off. Yeah. Very based, but not going to get you. Machiavelli would always say, yeah. you, can, you can be feared, you can be loved, you can be both, which is the best, but don't ever be hated. Uh, Damon's found himself being hated. Quite it's not a bit for him. Yeah. I'm um, feared and loved. Roll the snake eyes. Well, that's good. That means you're in an optimal position. Yeah, to you rule. weren't listening. Yeah. Machiavelli says, never be hated. No, I was listening. That's why I bragged about being feared and loved. I got, I got it all. You said it with the implication that you had risen above the the uh, baggage associated with it. If Machiavelli <laughs> was here, I would, I would say, listen. If he was here, he'd be looking at you like people sauce. He'd be oh. like, hmm. He'd be like, but is he though? And I'd be, yeah. I'll have you know, uh, I guess Theo and Fringy that Omni. That uh, pronounces it Machiavelli in in Angel. Oh, I wonder if that's better or worse than um, Al Albert Camus's. Albert Camus's. <laughs> Oof. That's not yeah, fair. No. Oh, that's bad. Doesn't it wound the soul? A little bit. It's it's actively trying to repair so that I can speak. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that, 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 uh, through that horrible little bit, uh, one of the highlights of what is already just a great scene is um, he spots his wife, uh, Lena, or rather ex-wife, I guess you'd say, um, and she just looks at him and says, uh, "Have you seen to the girls? Like, do you do you even care if you if you looked after them?" And it's just something that I don't think he. Is about it all. It doesn't seem to be that way. And there's something really interesting to, to consider. Uh, Damon is dealing with the fact, right, in this broadly, that he didn't support his brother properly. We get um, some stuff on that next episode that we'll talk about. He's very averse to even, like, doing a fucking hug. Now, if you remember when Lena died in season one, there was a bit of a controversy that came out because some behind-the-scenes footage was shown where he hugs his daughters after it's happened. But in the sh in the episode itself, he doesn't. And so people were like, why the fuck did you cut that scene? And I've been thinking about it myself, and I wonder if they cut it because, one, uh, he's going to go on an arc in this season where he's finally opening up enough that he's willing to sort of comfort his family members, primarily being Viserys, where he made his huge mistake of not doing that. And secondly, that it's a point of criticism in this season from, you know, the character to him, or rather to himself, that he's not cared more about his daughters. What do you guys um, think? That does make sense. I mean, he hasn't really... He hasn't had any interaction with either of them this whole season? The only interaction he had spoken? was he walked past Baylor and she asked to speak to him and he ignored her. Yeah, that's not great. If Yeah, it's the only parenting. thing... I, I can understand that. Um, I am wondering if the fact that his wife had just died would be something uh, big enough to actually get him to interact with his daughters in that way or in the moment he might do that because of the extenuating circumstance but i can definitely see what the show is trying to say by that by trying to build it up yeah i'm just speculating because yeah. i wonder if because it seems weird to cut something like that uh yeah nobody i don't think anyone would hold it against any character that seems unloving that they would hold their children when they're fucking wife dies it's not i don't think it'll be breaching anything at all about damon but simultaneously yeah it, it comes across to me maybe like they did leave it out because they weren't sure if it they felt it would match him or not but with the arc he's gone on in harren hall i can kind of understand it if that was the logic i don't know i don't know either in any case he uh mm -hmm. puts his hand on the fireplace staring into it struggling and they do a match cut of rhaenyra doing the exact same thing Kind of fun. They're both struggling right now. Though, honestly, I feel like uh, Damon's going through a little bit more of heavy stuff. You know, Rhaenyra is just fucking going to talk to Missaria every time. That's all it ever is. But, you know, he, if poor Damon has to speak to all the people who've died in his life that he loves. He has to fuck his mom. Yeah. I feel like that's worse. I guess it depends on the person, but... And talking you know. to Missaria? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, oof. You don't um, want to have to do that. Uh, don't, yeah. I don't know. So well, I'm talking to Masaria for sure. A, I'm, not, I'm not doing quite anything. Quite a quandary. The I don't plan. know. She's pretty bad. Plan's going ahead with 
we're, we're going to find out what it is eventually, but the important part was getting the Handmaiden of Rhaenyra into King's Landing in order to explain what the plan is from Massaria to the people of King's Landing. And she's going to get in because Massaria has a city watchman who's going to be loyal to her. Watchman! Um, it's a little... Like, it's fine. It just feels a little stretchy. Like, she turns up and the guy she needs to speak to happens to be on guard, speaks to him and gets in. And you yeah, have to kind it's of... done very quickly and expediently. Well, no, not expediently, but very... You have oh, to think about how it could go wrong. Could be that she oh, wanders around waste. enough, and then a City Watch Randy just says, Hey, who are you? What are you doing? And then she's like, uh, she can't be honest with him, because it would ruin her whole plan. So she has to instead be like, I'm just hanging out. It, seeing if I can visit my, my, my family in the city. What's going on? What's up with the gates then, being closed? Yeah, something? and then he'd be like, not allowed in. Gates closed. Bye-bye. And then she'd have to sort of back away and just wait, I guess, for a city guardsman. But she, like, wanted a specific one. It just seems really lucky, because there's going to be a shit ton of City Watch. Yeah, and uh, half of them, arguably, probably most of them, actually, are going to be on the inside. So there's already, off the bat, a, a pretty massive percentage chance that it's just, you just, he just, he's just he's going to be inside the city. He's posted on the inside, not the outside. And then, of course, just adding more to the list of things that Messaria had at the, her fingertips that she said she couldn't possibly help anybody with when she was first caught. It's continuously oh, making why? her more and more of a liar. But hey, yeah, he said, and, and uh, you know what's interesting too is he says, I thought she was dead. And um, she says something like, do you think she wouldn't, she, she would, like, I think she'd die without collecting or something like that? The very, like, it's a line that's very, um, Really badass when it, it doesn't really make sense. It's it's just like, well, yeah, her place burned down and I haven't seen her since, so I assume she's dead. It's it's very um like he would need more than that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there was like a code word or um maybe even a trinket that would prove something. Yeah, some, some token of understanding between them. Yeah, Masario would give this chick something to ensure that he knows. Yeah, that something she's maybe still the. Around. Missaria only knew about him, even. A symbol. Hell, I would settle for she whispers something in his ear, and then he goes, oh, and then she's like, yeah, 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 so call in the favor, you know? Because it might be hard to call as, something, but yeah, I don't know. As to finding the appropriate guard, it's okay, because they do the screenplay thing of her looking around. She looks at one guard, oh, that's not him. Looks at another one, oh, that's not him. And the third one, just like Goldilocks, it's like, <laughs> okay, that's the guy. There he is. Well, the next scene is Corliss deciding whether or not he's going to be the Hand of the King to himself and ultimately committing. I imagine he was just uh, having a lot to think about, sitting on his little uh, driftwood throne, which has got a neat which I really design. Like. Yeah. yeah, I like, um, in a way that the Iron Throne is similar, it's not, like, opulent. It's, uh, it's especially the driftwood throne, is a bit unassuming but thematically appropriate where you can feel like a lot of the symbolism and value that it has comes from not just its construction, uh, but what it represents in a way that's very confident. Mm -hmm. um, it's not trying to be, oh, look at me, I'm the big fucking chair. And the, the, no, it's, it, it's very, very confident in what it is. It's not cringe. Which moves Iron us... Iron Throne's a bit cringe, though. It's pretty cringe. It's pretty edgy. Moves us to Aemond, having himself, uh, he's, he's pondering the throne, having himself a ponder in the dark and lightning, spooky throne room. <laughs> Very appropriate for him. And uh, Helena's just behind him to the side, asking whether it was worth the price, which gives you the impression she knows a hell of a lot more than most people probably do. There's um, speculation. Uh... Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, mine was a different point on this scene. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I uh, I think Eamon would say, yeah. I think he I think he's very happy with the choices he's made to get to this position. Yeah, I don't think he regrets <laughs> this thing. The only thing I think he'd regret is he yeah. didn't manage to kill Aegon. Probably, yeah, that probably is what he would, would say. <laughs> Not much contemplation. You just think, you know I, what? I this is I fine. More, I think it's also just the, the meme when someone asks, "Was it worth it?" Is usually nah, but in this case, I think you just say yeah. <laughs> like it's not even uh, matter of yeah. Worth it. He considered these choices not even like too difficult to make. Yeah. 
Yeah, what I was going to say is there's like, uh, an interesting speculation of the relationship between him and Helena, being that in season one, he makes clear pretty early on that he'd have been willing to take the role that Aegon is supposed to have, marry her. And then, of course, the, the pure bloodline sort of stuff that I imagine he'd probably be interested in. The fact that she knows about a lot of this, but it's not saying anything. Um, it's just there's there's like is they is there more going on between those two than the show has let us know so far? I wonder. Perhaps we will find out. Perhaps we will. Hmm. Hmm. Which hmm. taketh us to Egon recovering very slowly, and Allison hanging out with him, and very depressingly leaves the room as he calls out for her. Uh, she doesn't catch that is it. That depressing. Well, it's, uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's got to be symbolic of the fact that she's just, yeah, you know. <laughs> just, Kids just, needed her and she wasn't there. Yes. And this is just, yeah. I think someone might say, like, how is that her fault? She was not going to be there 24-7. It's like, well, it's interesting because when Bran is injured in season one of Game of Thrones, Catelyn, his mum, is with him constantly waiting for him to get up. That's not to say that there's a correct thing to do or anything, it's just that Alicent is all over the place, completely destroyed, she's probably gonna miss moments like that, even though and, and like her parenting isn't gonna just fix overnight, she's struggling with dealing with the fact that it ever was flawed, right? She's she's coming to terms with all of it and um, I think she's just every every scene of hers is practically watching the repercussions of her awful parenting and so that's just another one from what I can tell. Uh, and it was it was her do nothing speech that essentially pushed him over the edge. Yeah, I so think she's just watching him and hoping that he uh, simply doesn't die at this point, which she can only feel is going to be uh, she's responsible at least somewhat, if not fully. Um, and that's the thing, right? Even if she did believe that Amond is fully responsible, who's responsible for him? And that's the. It all comes back to Allison. She's losing her mind over it. Remember, a lot of the decisions she made when Otto gave her possibly one of the most important speeches of her life was to protect her children. And all it's done is make them not only horrible people, but to suffer significantly, either themselves or make people suffer around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, neither of them turned out great. No. Could be better. Could be better. Which gives us the final scene of the episode where... Jason and Rhaenyra have a little chat about the nature of dragon riders and how maybe you could probably find some people who aren't necessarily pure or even half-blooded, maybe even just a bit blooded, some thin blood here and there. Yeah. And uh, if they could get a selection of those people or try out a few of them, if it works well, they can get themselves some amazing dragons, so it might be worth pursuing. Hmm, an interesting thought. An interesting proposition indeed. Which kind of wraps up the episode. To be number five. What do you guys think? I think we're uh, continuing. I, yeah. I I think episode five is, um, it's kind of hard to pick, like, you know, to rank them in terms of the best episodes, excluding four, which is the best one. Uh, but I think five is one of the stronger episodes of the season. Why? I uh, I think I think it's I think it's got uh one too many really really uh great scenes in there rather than just like the standard um assortment of good scenes that advance the plot. I'm mainly thinking about the Allison stuff, I suppose. <laughs> uh, th those That's are some true. really great. The scenes. Green Council scenes, they be bitching. Yeah, but he didn't have another dragon fight. Uh, true. Well, yeah, we I don't need him every episode. I think we got good stuff sure for pretty much everybody. I'm uh, when we get inclined to agree. Yeah. Um, Masario wasn't shit. in it that much. Yeah, she had one big bad scene, but that's come to be expected now. You just hope you don't get two. Like, you know you're lucky. Um, well, in any case, uh, since we only have John for another hour and 20-ish, uh, let's, let's soldier on, shall we? We can discuss... Carry right um, on. Episode number six which is uh, all about um, more things happening. Depending on who you talk to, though, you might assume nothing happens. What? We begin... Well, they'd be wrong. It ain't right. We begin at the Golden Tooth, 
where the Lannister army have arrived. And they're basically like, hey, we've got all of our stuff, but not really willing to go to Harrenhal because Caraxes could burn the fuck out of all of us with ease. And that would be horrifying, which I think yeah, is reasonable. So um, there's yeah, almost nothing they could do. Obviously, they can shoot arrows and stuff, but I mean, just swoop fire, swoop fire, and then leaves. That would already just destroy everything. Well, yeah, because the they don't have... Because if 900 were killed at um, Rook's, Rook's Rest, Rest, then, you know, and that didn't, I mean, and, and that was with, um, you know, the understanding that they had dragons on their side, too. So in such a quick time, that was able to be done. With Caraxes unopposed, they just destroy the army. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, well, <laughs> they've got um, lions with them, which I find... Such a Lannister move to actually bring caged lions with them, because they don't—I don't think they use them for warfare. They're just there as a symbol of the house. But the amount of you know difficulty it would take to control, feed, and just bring them along is like, yeah, look, we have lions. Them. Yeah, <laughs> they have the resources to feed. Aren't lions would be a cool, lot. and you're like, yeah. I mean, they are cool. I don't know they if they're cool, cool enough to go through all the effort of transporting them in tiny little throughout cages, a war. But, <laughs> they're so you know. vain, but I mean, it matches. I like. uh I enjoy the actor who plays both the uh, Lannister brothers, Tyland and uh, Jason. Is it the same brother? As far as I'm aware, it's the same actor. Or the same guy? Yeah. Okay, because I was about to say, they look super similar. That I guess they really found two guys that look really the same. Because one of them's like kind of in a helmet, and then the other one's, you know, so I was thinking, wow, they just look, they look exactly like each other. But I didn't know that I, I meant that more literally than I thought. Yes. Uh, and we... Cut over to Aemon getting a message from uh, Tyland saying, or oh, Jason, sorry, sometimes I get the names mixed up, I'm sure you're following well enough, that he's like, he dares to summon me, which uh, got shared on Twitter as bad acting. I thought that yeah, was wild. Yeah, I didn't wild. get that take at all. Coming at, um, uh, is it Ewan Mitchell is the actor for Aemon? Mm -hmm. Coming at him for bad acting is shocking to me. Yeah. He, um, he has been so consistent in playing Eamon, and the, one of the things he does that is such a great bonus for an actor that you don't typically get is uh, he's got loads of physical acting for Eamon. He does. Um, he looks very... He's got the look... He's got a very strong, pointy jaw. He's got the eye patch, the long hair that's really well, you know, like very smooth and kind of regal looking. He's very obviously physically fit. He has this, the mannerism, the way that he moves. Um, and, and one thing, too, that he does that a lot of people don't necessarily do well is that he can speak very softly, but be very threatening as he does it. Mm -hmm. um, I've always found him to be hyper impactful, and he draws everyone's eyes in any scene he's in, which to me is kind of the everlasting question of exactly what makes a good actor, but uh, I could never entertain he's a bad one if he's, he's managed to tick all those That's boxes. Yeah, that's wild. He's he's definitely very good. He has a very intimidating stare. He's good at mad dogging other characters. Oh, and yeah. also I think uh having the eye patch on can be a little bit of an obstacle to navigate around as an actor just cuz so much of it is in the eyes. Like he's got to make sure like yeah, he emotes properly through one eye. Um yeah. Uh so yeah, he's like this bullshit summoning me, not how it works. I'm Essentially, the king at this point. Fuck you. Yeah, he he, he found it very insulting, and oh he yeah, probably he was mad. Had good reason to. It has to be that Aemon has finally managed to achieve what he's wanted for basically his whole life, and then one of the first things that happens is someone saying, "You must come here." He's like, "Motherfucker, you did not just give me an order when I when I finally gotten to the point where I no longer have to take orders. That did not just happen." Um, it's about the house for him as well, I imagine. Oh yeah. The House Lannister does not boss House Targaryen around. That doesn't no. happen. Yeah, and poor Tyland having to take the brunt of his anger when he didn't say or do any of that. <laughs> he's just sort of sitting there like, please leave me alone. Because something I really love about the scene is it's, as he's yeah, giving him more orders, he fucking like almost climbs onto his chair behind him like and, and sort of like, you know, envelops him, the poor man who is clearly terrified of him. Um, and then of course you have Alicent trying to 
make it a bit more reasonable and you just cuts her off mid-sentence to uh, talk more to Island. It's, um, they're talking about the blockade as well being uh, a disaster getting in their way and stuff. And I was just thinking, would it be like out of the cards for him to just spontaneously take Vagar and just do like a bombing run and then come home straight away? Maybe just like two swipes onto the, the gullet for the main ships that he could identify. Or would it be too risky or is the worry that uh, he would leave King's Landing too open for, for doing that? Um, he... Proximity to Dragonstone, I guess? I suppose so, but that's kind of what I mean about the whole bombing mm. run thing. It's like get in, get out straight away. He... I don't know. I suppose any Maybe. dragon attack could be countered, and any counterattack could result in like irreparable damage I wonder if... or disabling damage to Vagar. Do they have scorpions over in uh, in the gullet? I wonder. I suppose we'll find out because they haven't done a lot there this season necessarily. We've heard about it, but we haven't seen a lot. I wouldn't be surprised, uh, but it would be I'm considered sure. quite the risky move. I guess, I, I mean, they were only rare in, in Game of Thrones because uh, dragon warfare had not been a thing for a while. So, like, none of those smiths had ever made one. Whereas there, like, they 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 assume that at some point they might have to kill a dragon. Like, even if mm. just one gets unruly. Like, if it's um, not war. Yeah, something he's after is for Thailand to treat with the Triarchy and get them to attack Corlys's, uh blockade. Which seems like a nutball plan because the triarchy are crazy pirate crazy. people. <laughs> um, but hey, it could be the right kind of crazy, could be the wrong kind of crazy. In any case, uh, that's apparently where Thailand is going to be off to because he's not on the council the next episode, so that's where he's apparently gone. And then, uh, yeah, Aemond is not being very nice to Alicent. This whole scene, he's kind of just completely ignoring her. Um, which, which is, you shouldn't do that. Not to your, to your mumsley, especially when she's on the council, you know? That's, that's just not nice. Unless, of course, you're planning to oust her from the council at the end of the very scene. That could be happening. Who knows? Um, what I find interesting is that he's not really taking her point of view seriously, and then Cole says, the Dowager Queen speaks wisely. Even if the blockade could be broken, are we to invite these alien raiders into our waters so close to King's Landing? And what does uh, Eamon say in response? He doesn't agree or disagree. He just says, it's time for you to go to Harrenhal. And uh, I quite like it because it's basically, he doesn't like Alison's input and he certainly doesn't fucking like having someone who's going to back her up. And he has use for Cole to order the armies to do shit. So he's just like, you know what? You can just leave. He doesn't even uh, entertain his point of view. The triarchy plan is going ahead. And this is kind of the, arguably the problem with Aemond being in charge, is uh, he would explain his plans, work with people, so, you know, sort of subvert here and there, but now it's more, it's my plan and we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Not really interested in your perspective. It's like, he's damn. not very flexible. No, and uh, maybe you wouldn't be if you've had the success rate that he's had, but I would argue he's going to possibly I think make some uh... mistakes. I mean, I think it's very much within character to Eamon to be like, yeah, this thing that worked, it was all my idea. This wasn't someone else's idea, mm -hmm. it was mine. We owe it success to me. So, um, I quite like as well in this scene, uh, Damon, sorry, Cole mentions the loss of life at Rook's Rest again. He says that uh, that, was, that was, he doesn't see it as a victory, which is somewhat uh, described that way by other people. Well, yeah, especially because Rick's Rest was supposed to be, and it even looks the part, it's a small little yeah. place that shouldn't have been a big deal to the point where the attacking of Rick's Rest was kind of discounted as the thing that would even be done necessarily because it wasn't of strategic importance. It was just this little place off there, and so it was supposed to be an easy, you know, 20-minute adventure, and it wasn't. He says, uh, the longer we wait, the more chance he will prevail. Lannisters will march in from the west, take what strength we have, and force Daemon and his river lords to fight on two fronts. And uh, Laris says, his grace speaks wisely. Which is very like, uh-huh. Doesn't even say why, he just, he just says that. You're like, All right. Please um, like me. <laughs> I'm bit. cool. 
Uh, yeah, and then so he sends out Kristen, and, he, and then Kristen's like, "Well, what are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh, I'll I'll help you when the time is right. I will totally help you." And he says, uh, "My uncle is a challenge. I welcome if he dares face me." And uh, you think the scene is over, but then he asks his mum to stay behind, and it makes for quite a good scene of essentially. They have a back and forth, and it's, it's done gradually, and I really like it, right? So at first it's just, why are you even on the council? And then she's, she can advocate for herself somewhat in terms of her ability and her experience. And um, he says she served for his father, and then he says my father's dead. And uh, the way he says Aegon is... Hmm. That's all he does, he just, he just literally M.M. Mm. <laughs> That's how he describes Aegon's current position. <laughs> um, yeah, and he says, you, were, you served the realm well in a time of need, but that need is ended. You are no longer obligated. And she says, it's not about obligation. And then uh, she says, he has the impetuousness of youth and its arrogance, neither of which is desired in a king. And then he just says, you're released of your seat. Which is, um... Sort of allows... Yeah, he said... Oh, such a fucking good line. He says, I release you of your seat such as it was. I'm sure you'll be much pleased to return to more domestic pursuits. Which almost feels like, uh... Possibly one of the most subtler ways of him saying you were a shit mum. When you go back to being shit at domestic... You know, like it's like she's constantly advocating for how good she is on the council, which he doesn't even necessarily agree with. And then he's like, don't worry, now you can go back to sorting, sorting out things that you were so fucking shit at. And then uh, she says, have the indignities of your childhood not yet sufficiently been avenged? Which, uh, they get to share a bit of a moment there because I think they both know exactly what's going on, but that's not going to change what's going on. What would you say you do here? <laughs> or if you were her? Wait, 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 will I, will, will I, I, uh, oh, I... Talking to her, yeah. I raised uh, two potential kings. <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's she obviously plays the part perfectly well again as well. The uh, uh, well, both of them, to be honest, both the actors, yeah, are top notch, and um, it does feel a tad vengeful of him. He kind of hates her. She was not what he would consider a good mum, and she knows that too. But at this point, she re resents him for who he is anyway. We already got all mm -hmm. this from the, the scenes where he's looking for motherly sort of support from, I think it's Sylvie was her name. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, this is just the conclusion now, which uh, again, every scene with Alicent, she's just getting knocked further and further down. She has now officially been removed from the council, so it's not even, you can't even pretend like she has a voice there. She absolutely doesn't. And she lost it because she's a shit mum, and I think that's really compounding over and over again for her now. Um, she's she can't do anything but face that over and over again. Kind of reminds me of Damon and Harrenhal. The worst. Boy, Damon and Harrenhal. Yeah, from... I like Damon and Harrenhal. The idea is from season one, coming back to roost very much. The idea that yeah. ideas instilled in the children then go far beyond what the parents can control. Or expected. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, what can I say? Green Council scenes, you know. Well, they're, they're really good. Television. The Black Council scenes. Guess what's next? Big, yeah, big contrast. <laughs> what's next? Black Council scene. <laughs> oh, boy! I sure uh, can't wait for all these characters, I understand. Well, so this scene is, uh, we get the official welcoming of Corliss as Hand of the King. Unfortunately, he doesn't Hooray. really do anything as Hand of the King in this scene, or... Uh, arguably, does he, has he had a, has a Hand of the King moment in episode... Six or seven? Uh, well, not like a real one if you mean coming in, you know, really like making known what's to be done uh, efficiently and then leaving. Nothing that makes he has, me he think hasn't about got himself, Otto. Yeah, he hasn't got an auto moment yet. Otto hasn't had much, much of an auto moment lately. Well, it's uh, amazing how high Otto's stock moments? is considering how little of the show he was in this season. <laughs> that's uh, that's what one yeah, amazing auto scene will do for him, I guess. Yeah. The Jaws tactic. So, he, uh, this scene is uh, Rhaenyra introducing the idea, which we really need to remember the POV of everyone in this room, right? She's saying, we have a lot of dragons, 
We have some people with distant Targaryen blood. Why don't we try and get some dragon riders to just jump on, see what happens? Now, try and imagine you're the council members. What, what are your opinions on this? Are you... Are you... Uh, How about no? You're talking about giving potential enemies nuclear weapons. You have to... So well, let's yeah, say, it's a bit of a you fucking want, mate. <laughs> you have to... <laughs> but you have to vet these people so insanely hard because yeah. the upside is very much an upside. The upside is potentially war-changing. Um... In both ways, though. Um, this is an idea that I'd be okay if it wasn't completely, immediately, fully discarded, if there was a more extended and drawn out and detailed plan of lists of specific people, candidates, people put in charge to oversee it, her well, personal maybe, oversight. Maybe work this with... conversation should be saved for episode seven, because right now sure, all yeah, they're yeah, dealing yeah. with is... Uh, her king's guard, Stefan Darklin, because the Darklins might have some Targaryen blood uh, in their family tree. Uh, so her, I, I don't know, I don't, was he like the her Lord Commander of the King's Guard equivalent? Like he's the like the main one, I think. Uh, yeah, he was the I, only uh, King's Guard that you saw in the Council. So that because I was just thinking to myself, would make sense. Do they need a Lord Commander of the King's Guard, considering? She believes herself to be the legitimate side, if you know what I mean. How does that work? Is, you know, like all the I official mean, shit of King's Landing. Do you? How much of that do you reflect over at Dragonstone when you're like, I should be there. You've just taken my seat. You know. Well, I, I guess you'd probably run things exactly as you would if you were at yeah. King's Landing, just like in a different place. Because you're like, okay, the usurper's on the throne right now, but I'm still the queen. You're still my queen's guard. Yeah, because people would all of the people in King's Landing, yeah, all the people in King's Landing abetting the traitor would be, yeah, yeah. seen as traitorous themselves. Um, so like where I'm standing for this is this is a wild, crazy, unprecedented suggestion, and the best case scenario is he gets onto a dragon that is now loyal to us, but that seems in just astronomically unlikely and has never been done before. And the worst case scenario is you're just going to get him killed. Uh, not not sure I like this plan. And um, Bartimus is one of the people that makes it very clear. He's like, this is a bad plan. We shouldn't do it. Um, but she doesn't care. She only cares about uh, Stefan's point of view himself. She says, like, this is something we kind of need, but I don't want to command you to do it. You've got to want to do it. And he says he does. Um, I said this when we were talking about it with Gary, but I wonder if that was a bit of a cop-out choice and that we could have had the drama here be more interesting if he had said he's not sure about it and then she says, I'm commanding you to do it because they're desperate and they have no dragons left, essentially. Yeah. Because Especially then, given what happens as yeah, a result. Yeah, because I, I think be the like, result oh, would that be that much deal. more impactful if he did it because of, out of honor for her sort of, like, thing. He's like, if it's a command, I'll do it. Uh, but if it's just a suggestion of an offer, I'd rather not. Because the thing is, it's, it's like, never been done. And, and dragons, yeah. you know, <laughs> they, uh, they're big and there's fire, so... Temperamental beings. <laughs> if you do not claim the dragon, the dragon's going to kill you. And I think it would it's add to a list of um, only slight fucking failures from the show's perspective, because the show clearly has uh, uh, done a bit of cleansing of Rhaenyra this season, which hasn't been the funnest thing, I think. It would have yeah. been a, a decision She's like that. not quite season one Rhaenyra. No. The show is and a big Rhaenyra fan right now. I feel like the, a decision like that is not only in character, but it would also, it would be kind of fair, as she could explain definitively that this is her making a move the council never thinks she does she thinks it's creative it's subversive it'll actually super duper help and maybe she would say something like well we'll you know we'll take some precautions i'm sure you'll be safe and then obviously he's not like we could have done it that way maybe but um i i, I wonder know. if anyone who's like auditioning to be a dragon rider is thinking like well as long as i have some high blood in me like even if it's a little bit i'm safe like just the mere presence of it at all. And they're not thinking about like whether it's too thin or not. And then so they think chances are if I do this, as long as I know that I come from a Targaryen at some point down 
the generational line, then I'll be okay. So chances are like this will work out and yeah. then I get to ride a cool dragon around. Awesome. Sort of makes me think though that like why isn't Raina dead if she failed to uh, coax yeah, yeah. a dragon multiple this is the thing she almost killed her. I could see it as it almost killing her. You know, oh, okay. it, it blasting and she jumped out of the way or something and then ran off. That's always possible. Yeah. Well, uh, well I thought there's a world we'll where lose... the dragon essentially just makes heavy overtures for you to go away rather than yeah, straight I mean, to the flamethrower. With Vega, yeah, uh, it... she threatened Aemond, and he could have walked off, but then he pushed again, and then she was like, are you fucking serious right now? That was still, like, one of the coolest fantasy scenes ever, by the way. That was really cool. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. We'll talk more about it in a second, because it's going to be made cooler by seeing the opposite result soon enough. But for now, Luigi's Mansion! And wow. The Mama. return of Viserys Targaryen. Oh boy. How oh, nice to see him. Oh, yeah. Adam. How he has been missed. <laughs> I, I think yeah. uh, Glidus or uh, Gary, somebody said, clearly he's returned to deliver one speech just so he could be like, you owed me an Emmy from last season. You clearly missed me. So <laughs> now you can give it to me this time. Did he really not? He didn't get one. What the fuck? No, nobody understands it. Nobody on planet fucking Earth understands it. it. Who this won? Is... Oh, I don't know. Well, Sir, did you did you say a nominated. win or a nomination? Did he get I any? Think he I don't think he even oh, got did nominated. He no Jesus, that's a, yeah. that. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. ridiculous. That's actually I mean, uh, ridiculous. I wonder who else got nominated that year. They could have well, all it. better. I'm curious as to who the winner was. Anyway. That it seems amazing. Let's talk <laughs> about it. So it's the throne room, and good old Damon is reliving uh, season one, episode one, where Viserys basically says to him, "What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, on the on the night I lose my wife and uh, my, I think it was Balon was the son that died. Yeah. Um, so that happens, and instead of supporting me, doing anything for me, you fucking celebrate." with your whores and your lick spittles. And what's different about this this time? Obviously, it's a new recording. It's it's him. He's come back. He's in costume, and he's doing the speech again. It's delivered slightly differently. What's important about it is um, during his speech, you just have Damon saying, don't, please, stop, don't. Like, because he knows this speech back to front enough that yep. he's it's been on his mind for his whole fucking life, it seems. And, of course, it would be because this is the big moment where he lost uh, being the heir to the throne, all because he was too self-centered. Uh, he wasn't thinking about the actual important thing, which is the Targaryen family. It's, it's, it's an irony in the character of, it's what matters to him the most, it's what he takes most pride in, and yet it's really that failure of his values, his, his, his sin being so fucking vain of himself that he, uh, he lets slip. You know what, I'm just fucking happy that it's me that gets to be in power. And uh, that failing cost him everything. Uh, Damon looks very sad and defeated here, and we never see him like this. Oh yeah, you can He's see some like tears with anybody. building up. This is uh, hard for him to watch, and I think this is the perfect avenue, because this is not real life. This is inside his head, where he gets to be... It's just him, if you know what I mean. He's This is where you'll see him most vulnerable. No appearance um, yeah. to keep up. So much regret. Uh, and it's just, yeah, if you're gonna pick a moment where he ruined his own life, it would be this moment where... He chose to do that and he failed his brother and I like as well of course that he runs away from him and the doors won't open for him and he's just saying please please open the door please like he's trapped in his own brain yeah trying to get out of there but he can't can't run away from that thing so easy well and it's a uh, Viserys is like thoughts. crying on the throne and you can tell it's an opportunity for Damon to do something but he just leaves him walks away which yeah. Uh, Matt sure, Smith, by the way, another brilliant actor in this series. For the, uh, he's got the Amen factor of very much physical acting all the time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gait that Damon has wherever he walks, it's very unique. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very like wide and um, I, I don't know. Almost, what it is. almost it's hard this... to describe. <laughs> it's it, it, you it, know it. It's you know it it is hard to describe because. It is apparently quite hard to describe. 
he has high poise in his stats. Be hard to <laughs> knock him down. Yeah, he'd be ready for you. Uh, but yeah, then, and then we just fucking transition into the doors open, and Simon Strong is like, oh, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he's like, you motherfucker, what are you doing to me? <laughs> he's like, whoa, oh, oh, jeez, what's, what's like, wrong? Like, oh, my God. I didn't do nothing. Um, and yeah, I, uh, this scene's super interesting because he's very pointed that Simon is behind this, and this, you know, it's partially a theory from the audience, and I wonder if it's, if it's a red herring or a misdirection of a misdirection. Like, how much does Simon know? I don't know. But the fact that he was able to point to him, at least in this moment, makes you think, like, oh, so maybe it isn't him. But it's like, no, maybe it is him. And who knows? Yeah. <laughs> like, who knows what's going on? Boy, I don't. Um, and I love that Simon, the one thing Simon gets to ask him is, are you getting enough sleep? And it's like, what? You, <laughs> that's like the problem right of now. Of all <laughs> things to ask me. <laughs> but, uh,. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's all right. He shushes him, and uh, David, I think David, David leaves, and he's like, "Stop watching me," which I find, Stop watching I find me. funny because <laughs> essentially his job to serve him. But he's like, "Okie dokie, bye." And then we get Damon getting so frustrated that he's gonna leave Harren Hall. You even see Caraxes in the background, like, "Finally, we're going, Dad," and then no, <laughs> <laughs> Alice says, "You gotta stay a little longer." Uh, this back and forth is pretty good. The uh, There's a couple of things she says that, again, she would not get away with normally. It would be interesting to look back on this as uh, what exactly Damon was... Like, like what, what his allowance of her was, specifically. But mm -hmm. um, she says to him, this is your way, isn't it? When something doesn't please you, you run. And she says, Dragonstone, Stepstones, Pentos, and Harrenhal, which... At this point, it's just like, you, you shouldn't know these things. <laughs> Why do you know this stuff? Stop saying yeah. things. Uh, Quit being creepy. Yeah. Does Is there Stop ever it. a point where Damon asks how she knows that? No, and that nope. feels like a clue as well. Of, I yeah. That's yeah. the thing that comes to my mind. It's weird, because it's, it's weird if someone, let's say, let's say um, extremely corporeal, was to say those things <laughs> to you, you'd be like, how the fuck do you know that? But the fact he doesn't even ask, I think that's totally deliberate. I think that mm -hmm. he knows why. Or he, he knows, but he doesn't know that he knows. Or yeah, why he knows that. For lack of a better explanation, it's like he's comfortable talking to her in a way that he can't even necessarily explain, and she slips in and out and then resets, and it's like he's not treating her at all as he does with interactions with real people, as, as though, again, it is something that he's comfortable with, even though it is in his head. You know, and that's not good that he's hallucinating it. <laughs> like, but but maybe he doesn't interpret it that way. I don't know. It's um, waiting for more on that one. We'll see. But one of the things she says is, uh, "You struggle to see. There's an anger that blinds you." Um, she never even wanted it, being Rhaenyra, the crown. She spared it no thought, and that's perhaps why your brother gave the crown to her. Perhaps those who strive for it uh, are the least suited to wear it. Which is, um, you know, a, a, an interesting thought. It's just one that's been. Uh, mentioned or pursued in loads of different ways, which is why I love that he cuts her off and just says, "Don't lecture me," which is very. <laughs> like, it's if she is in his head somewhat. It's just amusing that he would be like saying that to himself. Like I said, I, I'm more than convinced she is like her own entity, so to speak. But still, it's uh yeah. Whereas a statement like that would have been insight level fucking one billion in something like the acolyte. I enjoy that she says something like that and he's bored with it as insight. You gotta give me more than that sort of thing. Um, and she says, yeah, Viserys never wanted it. If you recall, it came to him and he did his best. It's not a prize to be won, but a burden to bear. Which is something that I've uh, been made aware of that book fans were annoyed with, because apparently Viserys did want it in the in the source material. Can't speak to that myself. Don't know if... Um, I'm un uh, like the, as a change goes. I don't think it does any damage. Yeah, I don't. I don't feel. I feel like it. I. I. I yeah, I don't see what the issue is within this show. Well, yeah, especially well, as well because line, um, Viserys is very different is in the book true, in general. Though. What was that? I mean, the line is true about it being like more of a burden than it is like a prize. Because if you look at it as a prize, you're never going to be able to accept the responsibility for it. 
Well, sure. And what we're talking about is she specifically mentions that he didn't even like seek it out. It wasn't something that he uh, he wanted, but apparently did in the original version of the character. But it's worth remembering that Viserys in the book is very different from Viserys in the show, and that George R. R. Martin has said he thinks the show version is better. Hmm. And he's the motherfucker who wrote him, so I don't know, I'm just saying. It's high praise. I think so. I think yeah, everybody thinks his praise. performance was amazing. It's going to be hard for the book version to beat him out, but uh, most people feel he does not, as in the show version is indeed better. Well, Especially since together. the show version gets the privilege of more intimately characterizing him due to the different yes. framing. Apparently, all the Emmy nominations went to the show's Succession and The White Lotus for Best Actor in a Drama. Boo. That, that, like, had good. that just seems yeah, wrong, so doesn't this, it? As in, like, this is the list. It was well, um, not, not even a nomination. Like that's that's no, really odd. It was, yeah, uh, no, three, just those two three shows for lead actor character. Succession. And then Pedro and, Pascal got one for Last of Us, and then Bob uh, Odenkirk, Better Call Saul, and Jeff Bridges was the last one. The three lead actors from Succession. They couldn't. They couldn't. Well, know, the give... thing is, is and, that, uh, that, that, that has... was the year uh, that Succession got like fucking every nomination because it was right. the last one. So it got it got twenty seven nominations. Um and yeah, man, those <laughs> first two seasons are great. Those first, first two seasons season were so was, superb. Yeah. We were glued yeah. to the screen. I haven't seen any of it. That's uh, okay. I have <laughs> seen a bit of White Lotus. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, it's at a place now where, unfortunately, thanks to the final season, I wouldn't recommend it. I was about to ask that, like, in it, the context of that, uh, is it worth it for the first two? Yeah, Four, the fourth season hurt God. us personally. It, the problem is that you, you will not want to stop at the season two finale. That no. was the peak of my investment personally. And if you told me, yeah, now's a good time to stop, I like that would be unfathomable. Right. Yeah. There'd be no way to stop. The story's not done. Um yeah, and three it's was very all right. exciting. It, three was all right. It was it was I'd say it's good. Um but oh four. Uh three treaded yeah. water a little bit and then four went yeah. off the rails, unfortunately. Yeah, forge mm -hmm. around. Which uh isn't unfortunate then that four was the one that got the most accolades in terms <laughs> of just Emmy Awards oh, and nominations. God, let's, not. let's not. Let's not. Let's not. Yeah. So, um, someone else that's fun is he sits down with uh, Alice and says, if you have any counsel for dealing with the River Lords, I'd be glad of it. And she says, Damon Targaryen asking for help? He just turns to her and goes, counsel. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not asking <laughs> yeah. you for help. I'm asking you for counsel. It's different. Um, Makes it even more interesting if this is, in fact, in his own head. Like, the sort of... I guess layers of self delusion almost that he's he's working with in terms of his image of how he treats himself and those around him and what he needs in order mm -hmm. to function in the society he's a part of. Um yeah, she says, Do nothing, and in three days' time the winds will shift. It's uh curious. And we'll see how that plays out soon enough. Next scene where uh, we've got Sir Stephen Darklin is attempting to claim sea smoke. Which, uh, if one was to assume what is required of a person up to this point, or claiming a dragon, we've only seen, I guess, the one... Ones, we've only, that's the only time we've ever seen it, I think, right? With uh, uh, Aemond? Because I was just thinking... I don't even think in, we saw it any other time. In Game of Thrones, Jon rides one of the dragons, and I don't know if that counted as claiming it, but it, it wasn't much of a thing. It wasn't like a test or anything, it just sort of happens. Uh, so, yeah, I think I feel like that's the main actual example. Uh, the One of the dragon keepers says, do not show fear, which uh, is the primary connection I seem to see in any of the scenes in House of the Dragon, of which we get a grand total of like four uh, uh, as of episode seven. Of different claimings, and the key factor seems to be to not show fear, which I would sort of argue is not even necessarily that, it's to be on uh, the equal playing field with the dragon, like in respect and understanding and synchronicity, right? Like there needs to be that, and if you're afraid of it, that's obviously not happening. Um, mm -hmm. and this I scene... think that makes sense. It, yeah, and that and you need that, to be like Chris of... Pratt with the Raptors in Jurassic Park. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
And yeah, the, the, the way this scene is done is uh, Stefan is just fucking terrified. He's trying to overcome it, the poor lad, but he ain't doing a particularly good job. And Sea Smoke sees right through him. Even though Sea Smoke seems on board for the most part, and then sort of goes like, nah, you're too shit. Which is uh, unfortunate, but seemed beneficial in terms of setting the groundwork for what a failure looks like and why it might mm -hmm. happen. Um. And obviously, it's kind of sad because he was he was just trying to help. That he that this was yeah. to him like a big honor, but he was just too afraid. Dragons could be pretty scary. Ah, I mean, can't yeah, blame that's him. Terrifying. I guess this isn't something to bring up now necessarily, but a lot of my book reading friends and whatnot were thinking just because this isn't going to work because Lenor is still alive. Right, that's supposed to be a sort this, of for life kind of thing. This was something in that... the book. Uh, even show watchers should be discussing because there's no rule being set or under like acknowledged here, which is unusual for the show. They've either Lenor is alive and the bond has been severed, Lenor is dead and the bond is gone, or Lenor is alive and the bond is still possible, but that you can have an additional rider set a new bond, which. Any of these three have not been confirmed. A lot of people pick one to be their preference. I know a lot of people have been saying, obviously, the bond is just separated and he wants a new one. Um, but I know, I think, uh, I can't remember if Ryan has said he believes that Leno's just died, that that's probably what's happened. I don't know what the show is up to exactly, but it's weird that we didn't get a line to explicitly acknowledge this being interesting to have happened. I guess the is like maybe because he's so far away um but i don't well it's one of the three well, right I, who do yeah. like i guess the only one who knows for sure that 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 uh Lainor is alive would have been damon right or like would Rhaenyra know or would she think he's dead well n n none of them would know anymore it's been way too long we have no idea what he's doing if he's still alive or not we i assume they'd say they hope that he is alive but, but I'm thinking if it's only Damon, that Damon's not here to say anything about that, you know? I don't like, think Damon would know they... either way. Oh, fair enough. Part of the deal, right, is to disappear from the world. From season one, so... Uh, well, if... but I mean, it, but what I meant is if Damon's the only one who knew that he made the disappear from the world deal as opposed to killing him, if everyone else actually thinks he's dead and Damon did that to, like, protect him... I'm pretty sure Rhaenyra would have been in on the plan. Maybe, yeah. But I, I guess we don't really know, though, right? Um, I'm pretty... I, I th it's like a 99%. Like, Rhaenyra suggests doing the plan in general and that she says, like, you know, Lena would need to die. Um, I, I assumed that we were shown that and then they do the, the sort of trick back and forth to let us know that, that the actual plan wasn't to kill him. It was to make him seem like he had died and that he's actually alive but the she i can't imagine she wouldn't have been fully in on that plan the same with damon yeah that's probably true and i mean I, like it's a harsh world him dying is very reasonable that's what i'm saying the, there's the three answers and you'd think the show would have confirmed one of the three because it kind of changes significantly depending on which answer they go with as in the the rules because you know the idea that yeah. a dragon could have two riders at once would actually be like whoa what the fuck that was a pretty big game changer. They'd be constantly be trying to steal each other's dragons. Potentially. I mean, you know, it's only, you know, give it a shot, maybe. I don't know. In any case... There's all sorts of extenu extenuating circumstances they could make up for that, but I don't know if yeah. they would. We shall... It's not necessarily that they've ran out of time to explain it, you know? They could at any point say whatever they want. Mm -hmm. um, the other interesting element of this scene is Sea Smoke does burn... Uh, Stefan alive, along with a dragon keeper who takes out his dragon glass knife and slices his own throat. Pretty rough, but I guess to make the suffering end a little faster. And from what I gather, they actually like ritualistically create those knives as part of their like ascension to being dragon keepers. And that uh, this is part of the point of having them is in case you are ever burned by a dragon, you can take your own life quicker, because it's yeah. horrifyingly painful. Which, um, just a bit of scary will building, I suppose, but yes, the point is, he fails, and he gets burned, and Sea Smoke is not happy to the point where he straight up leaves Dragonstone, that's something they report, uh, 
not that it's something he's never done before, it's just that that's not preferable. You're going to want all the dragons at Dragonstone, probably. Yeah, you never know what he's going to get up to out there. True, because he will be getting up to something. We'll see exactly what that is eventually. The, um, the question I had, though, about the dragon keepers there is they all ran away and left him to burn. Like, I was like, what? what is the point of the dragon keepers if, if not for when something fucks up? I mean, what, they what, what are they going to do? Gonna do? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Chuck a spear at him, fire an arrow at him, throw a knife. It, like, um, throw a <laughs> knife. That seems like a really bad idea. Well, again, I think part oh, no, no, of the no, whole... Not at, not at the dragon, at the guy. I know. I, I, yeah. I, I, I throw a knife at again, him. He's on he's, fire and he's oh, well, cutting his own throat I'm open. I think, I well think he's got it. The, their whole thing seems to be get the fuck away from the dragon that is out of control. Yeah. The dragon keeper's job is to grab a fucking tomahawk and throw it at the guy. Yeah, I, was, the I, was naming, I was naming potential ranged weapons. Okay, I didn't think the throwing knife was going to be the likely tomahawk. one. Like a, a bow would probably make the most After sense. After they do it, they're like, yeah, let's look at that fucking final kill can. <laughs> they do yeah, the arrow would make the coolest one. See Turn around, in. throw it off of the far wall, bounces off like three walls, and then hits <laughs> in the head. So, well, I'm saying, like, they, they thought to provide an item that lets them kill themselves, so you figure they'd also be trying to kill other people that might be dying in agony. Maybe, maybe if the dragon wasn't right there. Yeah, they, yeah they, I like I said, true. the first reaction they all have is get the fuck out, get the fuck out, get the fuck out, because, you know, more deaths. He was. Yeah. As wild as they were, as the dragon was like well away from them, though. Like, like um, he, the dragon turns around pretty quickly. I think they're all fleeing at that point. Yeah, that's true. Uh, sea smoke is badass, though. Love the design. I'll be saying yeah, that more. I, I, too. I think, uh, yeah, the, I think the coolest one. Oh, it's tough to say, actually. It is tough to say, because um, you could go with the pieces of character you get, the design of them, or like what kind of like ferocity they have or history they have. You know, the dragons in the show are cool and neat. Neato. They're very cool. Uh, Corliss wants Alan to come with him on his ship for stuff, and I think the purpose of this scene is to show. Alan is getting raised up gradually, and we, we can all assume what uh, Corliss is after with that, while Adam is in the background looking kind of pissed because he's not getting anything in relation to that. He's feeling a little unfulfilled. He's got a lot of unfulfilled potential. Hmm. I wonder if there's any outlet for that. Who knows? Uh, following that, we've got a little scene in the bar with Ulf, and he's, he's getting told... Good old Ulf! He's getting told by propagandists created by Miss Massaria to start spreading the word around King's Landing that, you know what, the royals ain't taking care of us. They're eating all the food and they're letting us starve. Isn't that horrible? And he's like, yeah, that's not good. That's yeah, that sucks. Like, the series wouldn't let this happen. I hate fish. I hate fish, 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 and fish. I will say, uh, I think it's appropriate to have what would be considered in-universe bad acting, but uh, the woman, uh, Madam Sylvie is her name, she says... Oh, where is this? Something... Oh, yeah, it's very performative. She says it's something like, can you believe they're doing this while the true heir to the throne doesn't get to be on the throne? Isn't that just awful? Dot, dot, dot. Oh, I'm so sorry. I should not be speaking publicly of such things. It's like a play. Yeah, if you said they like, what are you doing? <laughs> are, you, the we, are we allowed to say this publicly? Well, uh, is this <laughs> obviously she's uh, doing it for reasons saying... stuff? But yeah, it, it is a yeah, fucking yeah. risky thing to say publicly. Are you trying to get me to agree to this so that people just come in? Is and this kill a me? test? <laughs> yeah. Is <laughs> yeah. Like you're doing, uh, you're doing some treason there, huh? You're just uh, throwing out some treason. Why not? So next up, Bartimus Keltagar is explaining to Rhaenyra the situation after what's happened with her Kingsguard. He says, I am far from alone among your counselors in holding this to be a truly unfortunate result, your grace. Sea Smoke has fled Dragonstone. The Stefan was a valiant knight, most regrettable, if perhaps foreseeable. And he says, I myself, if you recall, was in favor of treating with Lord Mooton to march on Rook's Rest, a more conventional approach, true, but not as sensational. And uh, 
His numbers were few, but we may yet, and then she slaps him. And she says, it's my fault that you've forgotten to fear me. What do you guys think of this? Hmm. I... Oh... I don't know how I feel about this, actually. I understand the position she's coming from, but also she she's not exactly been succeeding a whole bunch. Well, I mean, isn't it just clumsy as, as hell to just be like, you should fear me, or right, bye. Like, I mean, good job, buddy. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, you might like... want to actually do something after something like that, rather than slapping hmm. a man. Well, if I can present what I believe to be a bad take, and then my wacky take, uh, the bad take, I believe, I, I have heard from several people, is... Bartimus was being misogynistic and ignorant, and she slapped him good, and he deserved it. I... Can we stop using that word? I, I, it's <laughs> ruined. Let it go. <laughs> My wacky take is... Is that a fun run? I don't Change enjoy uh, the scene for it being the right move for her to slap him. I enjoy it as a reflection of her weaknesses as a human being. She fucked up, hugely. Yeah, and the counselors told emotional. her not to do it, and they had to watch her fail again. And in a civil way, he's trying to explain to her what happened and what needs to happen next, and she can't handle it because she keeps fucking up, and so she slaps him, and then she threatens him. I like it as... I can... uh, see, Rhaenyra's not got this under control. She's not doing great. Uh, All right, yeah, I, would, I can I see that. With that. I suppose the thing is, do you think that that's... Do you well, think the that's show the thinks, no. Yeah. No? Okay. I think the show thinks yeah. that she's right and that she does need to instill a bit of fear because that's what a proper ruler does and that he had the balls after a, an emotional sequence there where she needs to recover to start talking to her about, oh, yeah, let's go send armies this way. Oh, you could, you know what? I told you not to do it. Uh. And I think that's bafflingly naive when he is a counselor. She's hired him as a counselor. He's got what he's, what he's a he's lord, to do. yeah, and 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 he keeps being ignored. So, um, yeah, I like I, I would rather just ignore for a moment what I think the show and the writers want, and instead treat the scene as an example of her failure. Uh, yeah, that's how I I I think that's a more reasonable read on it, just based yeah. off of what's just happened. And yeah. well, I mean, I guess with all of this in mind, by this point, up to episode six, what's uh what's the general vibe on Rhaenyra as a character? I think she's taken quite a lot of damage this season, frankly. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Masaria is a tumor on Rhaenyra. Yeah, <laughs> Rhaenyra, not... who's already eh. I think well, uh, was was not I, problem. she was not that high on my list of favorite characters in season one anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought, but I do feel like season two has not been amazing uh, for that character. Yeah, I mean, the top scorers for us, I assume, haven't much changed. Obviously, Otto is starting to wane just for the oh, sheer like fact that he hasn't had a fucking line. line. <laughs> like, yeah, which, no. you know... Um, as but... much as the difference is, that I would say that if you would have, you know, if if uh, if the faces of the show are Rhaenyra and Alicent, in a sense, I feel like Alicent is far more, way interesting. more interesting. Well, she's scoring Easily, way higher way for more us, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, way more complex, a lot more going on, way more interesting. Well, then, Rhaenyra's then, yeah. not being given a lot of people to work with. Well, unfortunately, since... she has a lot of scenes with what's her name. Well, so yeah, like, Masaria. why? Where, what was Corliss's perspective on this whole event that just happened? He's her hand. What does he have to say about this? You know, I guess <laughs> probably a lot. <laughs> anyway. Because I feel like the Black Council meetings would be a lot more fucking interesting if we had him be like, okay. He, he meant something to you. You ordered him to do that, and that's what happened. Do we think that we should maybe never do that again? Is that where we're at? And then she could be like, I don't want to speak of this right now. And then he could be like, we have to speak of this right now. This is very important, and you need to be ready to have these conversations. You know, that sort of thing. I feel like it could go a hell of a long way instead of just slapping yeah. people who ask you questions. Yeah, if Corliss needed to be there to be like, all right, listen. I need to know we're fucking around, okay? Hmm. I'm here to do a job. We've known each other for, you know, 
an amount of time. Well, my wife died for you. I'm owed something yeah. of uh, respect. I, yeah, yeah. That's an angle that I'd really like to see. You don't want to disincentivize people on your council from challenging you. Furthermore. Being honest with you, yeah. Yeah. Even if they chronically disagree with you, as long as they have some reason for justifying their position, like you want them there as just another to offer another perspective on important matters that you might not be considering. <laughs> Considering we're on this topic, I will say the next scene is we follow Rhaenyra into talking to Masaria, and it is another oh boy. <laughs> fucking bad uh... scene. We open with Masaria saying, it was worth the risk no matter the outcome. No, it wasn't. That is not true. Why would you even say that? It's not always worth the risk no matter the outcome. You crazy? Like, we, are we just going to kill everybody until we get a dragon? What nonsense yeah, is this? Especially a guy as great as he was to her. He was such a valuable asset in terms of his loyalty. Loyal, skilled, and, a... and a part yep. of an important house. Oh, well. Down he goes. Obviously, Very it, what, what, I already, like, it's the, the first thing she says, and it's already just like, fuck off. What a bad line. So then, um... Uh, Rhaenyra says, what, more good men killed? That's my fault. And Masaria says, so Stefan went willingly. As if that's what like a of... meaningful what? rebuttal to what she just said. So it's okay he then. Willingly, but like, wouldn't it have been way better if he was still alive? Yeah, yeah uh, well, it's and, so and... much better if you lead willing men to their deaths. He went willingly because he was told it was possible when you have no idea if it actually well, is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as he was there burning up, do you think he was like, well, you know, I mean, I chose this, so it's chill. Yeah, that just doesn't make it okay, and it's not at all the interesting route to take here. And it starts to become a thing of, Rhaenyra, do you, do you like Masaria the most because she just doesn't challenge you in any way? Well, I think that's the annoying thing about that character, is it feels like she's essentially there to make declarations on behalf of the writers about the way that you ought to feel about situations. And, and then, then to buff her up, you know, to boost yeah. her ego. Masari was annoying me more in this scene than Rhaenyra, but then Rhaenyra says, It was a reckless thought that an ancient Valerian beast would suffer a darkling to ride it. Then why... <laughs> Race then why... Well, why so... did we get... That's not position? the attitude you should have when he just died for you. Like, that yeah, feels seriously. weird, man. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm more than fine. Like him. I get the Targaryen <laughs> supremacy thing from all Targaryens, but that doesn't feel like Rhaenyra's character whatsoever to, after he dies, comment on how he had fucking mud blood, you know? She's like, whatever, he was a fucking Darklin, why would I have expected anything different? It's like, wow. And also, like, surely that's a thing that, again, show, that's a bad thing that she said there. That was very mean. It was very mean. Like I said, it's, it's bad that she, he's, you can say it's bad that she believes going, it, but wow. how inappropriate to fucking say at that point, when you know for a fact that everyone would have said what Bartimus was saying to her was inappropriate because she's currently experiencing emotions. But apparently not. She's gotten over it so quickly, she's now being racist. <laughs> it's like, okie dokie. <laughs> Can't be racist to white like people, Mahler. What about Racism Darklands? Racism is how she copes. Oh, absolutely. I'm racist to the Darklands all the time. I mean, like, Darn they're them. people. Ugh. And yet, yeah, her playing with a sword, by the way, like a fucking child, uh, Miss Arya says, if I may, your grace, this becomes you. Like, Shut like, up! You look cool with the sword. I, it's so Stop tiring. Talking. She treats Does you it... like a child and you don't even notice. Does it not just read perfectly as, like, an insidious foreign agent, like, trying to work her way into the good wills of, uh, I guess, somewhat gullible and vain queen, so that she can, you know, make use of that for her own ends or some, I mean, in some that's way. What, that's the thing, like, that's the correct way to read it, based on all of the yeah. information that has yeah. been provided so far in the story, but unfortunately, it is just, but, no, she just is actually, true. like, helping her out, and that's... And everything that she's meant to be saying here is meant to be taken as essentially true observations. It's, it's such a... an unfortunate thing about, like, the dynamics, right? That, that when you watch the Green Council, there's so many different sort of variables at play and everybody's got their own agenda. And it's, it's like, recognized as such by the show. And so all of the scenes are written with that in mind. Whereas with, with the, uh, the Black Council, it's just everybody else, their opinion doesn't matter. Masaria, everything half of it's Masaria, is, yeah. is yeah. it's just true. That you are meant to take these as, like, true, accurate, intelligent observations. 
It'd be funny if they just write her out between seasons and just say, oh yeah, she was a spy or something. She went to we a home planet. A she died on the way. <laughs> she was executed between scenes. Uh, between Damon seasons. Damon left and took my interest in the Dragonstone plotline with him, I guess. <laughs> a little bit. Well, because uh, what they talk about in that scene is their plan to uh, that they're going to give the small folk of King's Landing access to food through a bunch of boats and they're going to enact it soon enough to get, like, you know, benefit with them and everything. And I was just thinking to myself, right, Missaria is supposed to be the character that is f of the people for the people, so to speak. That's why she likes Rhaenyra, because she's like, you know what, you do care about the people, and I care about you, and we're going to make this work. This uh, It's an archetype that's been done before in Game of Thrones as well. The thing about it is, like, uh, you're going to be the one that provides them food, you'll be seen as great and everything. And I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> like, I kind of hate Missaria because... The show, I think, believes she's the hero of the people as well, yet her plan was to use the people's suffering to her advantage, right? Like, Rhaenyra is the reason they're, they're starving, and Rhaenyra is going to provide the food that was already meant for them back to them to make the claim that she's taking care of them. That's obviously manipulation. Everyone knows that. It's a tactic, and it's going to work because people want food. So you can't you can't really have that and have Miss Arya be clean as the person who's advocating for the safety and happiness of the people, the small folk, you know? It's like, well, you're you're using their suffering as currency. You're no better than anyone else in this story. That's something I'm mm -hmm. very glad that you brought up because I don't think the show wants to acknowledge that this is not like a this is not some benevolent move from Rhaenyra. No. And she is not, like, clean in terms of uh, how she deals with it. Because, again, she is the reason they're starving in the first place. So it is very much like a token gesture to give some of the food that they would be getting anyway. But not before relabeling it. It's riots, yeah. Like, isn't that funny? It's, it's, this is the food I stole from you, but I put my name on it now, so... <laughs> but I think like, it, hmm. it feels like the show doesn't realise, or doesn't want to admit, I don't know, one of the two, that... She is in. She is in fact very much responsible for their situation in the first place. So that does yeah, the, get the civil war is yeah. That does get somewhat highlighted um, in the next scene. Damon's uh, so Eamon says, "Why is it that they're mad at us when Rhaenyra is the one that cut off the food to them?" And I think there's nuance in the fact that they look to their king to provide, and if he doesn't, then he's failing, so to speak. I get that. My problem comes in where the show thinks Rhaenyra is doing a good yes. thing. I get that the people would feel a particular way that that works. It's just yeah, being like, gosh, what a what a nice person Rhaenyra is feeding the people. It's like she's starving them, so don't don't start. Because I think they they have quite like happy heroicish music for when her food arrives. Sort of like mm -hmm. you did it, accomplishment. You did a we're good thing. We're taking care of the small folk mm. that we're starving. Curious. Uh, yeah, this, because this, we get another scene of the small folks seeing sheep being brought in for the dragons, but barely any food being left for them, so they get more and more restless. And and we get a Green Council scene that, unsurprisingly, is fucking really good again. Yeah, crazy. Um, they're talking about that being the problem, and uh, the uh, the Laris says. They look to you to ensure their well-being. That's the burden of authority. But you shouldn't go it alone. It does occur to me that your grace has yet to name a hand. Sir Criston, of course, served your brother, but you need one that may advance your cause with shrewdness and subtlety. And there's this shot of um, Ironrod is the name of the character across the table, and he looks at Laris as he's saying this and does like the the eye roll thing of just like you motherfucker, you just fucking suggested yourself. Everyone knows. But obviously, what's <laughs> so satisfying about it is that he's not the only one that figured it out. Fucking Amond saw this coming a mile away. Yeah. <laughs> it's so <laughs> pretty good. clear. I imagine Amond was just waiting for this. <laughs> yeah, which uh, yeah, extremely satisfying. Not because I don't like Laris, I do, but I do enjoy his. His tricks don't work on everyone. That's always fun when uh, someone can see through that sort of planning because it's, it's it's a bit of a moment for the character to be like, wait, what? This always this always works. <laughs> it's it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> you guys always what what's going on? Um, and he says, "Do you take me for a fool? Uh, I have I have little patience for self important for the self important, and even less for flatterers and lick spittles. But you're right, as it happens." Uh, Every king needs a hand. I'll make it your responsibility. And there's this great moment of Laris being like, 
Oh, it, you it's an me. honor. I'm honored. I've never even considered myself to be. He goes, no, you toad. <laughs> you're the, you'll fetch toad. the hand, not you're going to be the hand. And, he's, and then he says, send word to Otto Hightower. And it's like, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Perfection. Um, Otto. I just love I the said... idea that he's like, yes, you can fetch my hand, you piece of shit. You're not going to be him. <laughs> And he says, my, uh, my grandsire may be overcautious, but his devotion to his family has never been in doubt. Which, yeah, it's just a smart decision. The High Towers are not going to betray the crown. Mm -hmm. While Laris, we have no idea what Laris is up to. Yeah. It's, uh, you always get that moment of him going to be like, why are you here? What do you what do? You do? <laughs> yeah, who are you? Do you are, are you are you just like the resident? Uh, are you are the resident evil? For lack of a better term? Is <laughs> yeah. that just what you are? Is that so. your job? And, uh, yeah, you get a distinct impression from that moment that Laris climbed too high, and he's been knocked down to the rung below, which at this point would be Aegon, the last person that his plans worked on, so... Probably he gonna go too high too fast. Yeah, because yeah. his stock with Alicent, you know, after the... You She's kind of useless now. ...episode is, yeah. It's almost like, well, what's the point of even, you know, cozying up to her? Well, mm -hmm. also, like, Laris has done nothing for aim Endeavor. He, he he planted a couple seeds saying he was wise a couple times, but that's about it. Yeah, he, is, he, he didn't have much of a foothold. Um, he definitely jumped too fast, that's how it came across. He wasn't even that subtle. He's usually subtler, but to be like, hey, you need a hand. Hi. <laughs> it's like, what, 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 are, you, what are you doing? Uh, Do you think there are any grounds on which to criticize that as a decision he would make for being so unsubtle? Well, Maybe um, because he's been successful with everyone else. He yeah, I could see it was overconfidence. Unassumed... Also, like, Kristen Cole and Eamon have done things together. Like, why would he think that he would be better suited for it than Kristen would be? Saying as Kristen's already the hand. Considering um, the recent attitude, if you have been watching the council scenes, right, you could even pick up... Uh, as a as a council member, there's tension between him and Cole now. Something, yeah, yeah something's going the... on. And then him <laughs> sending Cole off. Cole isn't even here, so he, you know, acting hand maybe. But yeah, he mm -hmm. seemed to reach. I think he even saw it as like it's between me and Iron Rod. Okay, so it should be me. Without thinking about how Eamon might not even like him at all, which is something I guess he didn't entertain. Yeah. yeah, you'd think he would have been a little more careful, but I can believe he was like, this is the final one. I just gotta get this, and I'm I'm Hand of the King. I'm basically the second most powerful person in the kingdom. That'd be fucking great. Maybe he even thought, I don't really stand much to lose by just putting my name out there. Yeah. See, like, just put out <clears throat> feelers, see if this works. If not, I have a backup plan. Um... On that note, I should probably uh, exit Mr. John here. You're running out of time. Uh, so, we appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And... Yeah, sorry, I got to jump early. I got a prior obligation, but I really appreciate you letting me be a part of this. And I'll oh, you see bet, you on the you next bet. one. No problem. Great we will you, see you later. Gotcha, Catch you dude. next time. Later on, dude. Bye, bye. Later, guys. No. Bye. So, Eamon visits Aegon. Because he's a friendly, happy brother who wants to support his bro while he's healing. Uh, That's he's right. What a cool dude. dude. Yeah. I don't think you're describing the scene accurately. He what? says he, he's concerned about Aegon's memory. He's concerned that he's safe and happy and recovering. He mentions to the to the maester it seems like he's going to have a long recovery. It all seems very positive language to me. Yeah, this is all positive coded. Yeah, that's what they say. Mm -hmm. um, though uh, he does hand him his, his council ball. Uh, I wonder if there's symbolism there of some kind. Um, also, crushing it in his hand. Got to yeah. feel bad for him just a little bit. Um, yeah, all buster. Yeah, would it be safe to say that... I think there's subtle ways that Eamon could kill him, right? Surely poisoning his food would probably be the way to go. It's a bit of a tough one to pull off without, obviously, people being like, what, what the fuck? Why did, uh, yeah, why did he die of poison when he's That would be not really fucking weird, yeah. Through... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, because he's certainly not going to be able to kill him with standard violence uh, at any point without it being super sus. Especially with the uh, all while seems to be a little kind of like, are you, are you, what are you doing? You seem, you seem, even though you're a brother, you seem to be too interested. Maybe it's because he knows Aemon and Aegon did not exactly fucking like each other. 
But uh, there's a little, they get like sus eyes every once in a while on each other, just like, what are you, uh, what's up? You, you're not, you don't do anything mean, right? Um, but I, I wonder what's going through Eamon's head is if um, the to kill or not to kill meter is like balancing back and forth, you know? Mm hmm. It's, uh, but the longer he waits, the more healthy, so to speak, or the more recovered Aegon will be, and the harder, presumably, it will be to kill him. But I find it all rather interesting. I'm sure Aegon is very uh, terrified, regardless. Yeah, there's going to be something that's going to be happening with this Maester guy and what he sees and what he's willing to do and where maybe, I don't know, what does he see his position as, you know, what, what is he supposed to do? Especially because he's caught in this ridiculously weird, awkward kind of situation between you know, Aegon and Aemond and what's mm. what am I supposed to do? What can I get away with? Am I just going to go with the flow? What's he going to be up to? Uh, we get a Raina scene, and she spots evidence that a dragon is nearby. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Oh my goodness. And she... Yes. Really wants to have a dragon. Yes. She did say that, didn't she? She, she wants did. a dragon. Yeah. yeah, she had mentioned that. She might just get a dragon. She might just get a dragon. You think? Who knows? Because then Jane is like, oh, uh, time to go. Obviously, Prince Reggio has set up the Gay Abandon. Um, uh, that's the ship name. I think it's a great name. I love it. Well, that's Lenor That's Lenor's character, the Gay Abandon. He left uh, Westeros and... Yeah. Um, and she's like, you misled me. There is a big dragon here. And um, that's that's. she's like, yeah, there is a big dragon here. Came once the war started, looking for food. Don't know what to do about that. It's like, all righty. I mean, it, you know, you, you know what this is going to be leading to. There's not much else for us to say. We kind of covered it earlier. It's just, yep, she, yeah. girl wants dragon. Dragon is around. I don't think... If if she just finds it and claims it and then has a dragon, I I do I will say like in retrospect they they really didn't make that that interesting at all. That's all. No, nothing one interesting dragon, happened. Yeah, she dragon. bitched about it, found one, got one. Yeah. And uh, speaking of a scene that doesn't achieve very much, um, this might be this is this is one of like three across the season where I would possibly consider outright removing. It's um, uh, Adam and Alan explicitly stating their current standing and motivations, which we kind of knew already from I, subtler stuff. Yeah, yeah, I got that one. <laughs> Thank you, show. It's, uh, it's kind of weird. The, the dialogue is very forced and it's very explicit. It feels like a reshot thing. It was like, we got to have this in here, guys, because uh, I think some people didn't catch it. We are bastard sons of Corlys. One of us tries to hide that fact and doesn't want to be benefited from it whatsoever because he values the life he carved out for himself, while the other one feels he deserves to be raised up. Now, the first one is getting raised up gradually and possibly becoming, you know, an actual full-on official son, while the other one feels he's got nothing to make of his life. Gish God, I wish, I wish something would come to me that would give me a chance to do something with my life. I sure do wish that. And it's like, okay, yeah, I knew all of this. <laughs> like yeah, just... thumbs up. We were getting there. Um, we had, had scenes cause... where they'd said this to each other. And I want to be clear, this show gets a lot of criticism for wasted time, repeated scenes, or bad pacing. Um, I very much don't feel that way. I just wanted to highlight the ones I do think are redundant, and that's one of them. I feel so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess you get to see um, Adam shaving his head and... Uh, oh, okay. The white hair, but we white sure. Hair. We it's just have done again that in a different way. Yeah, it's also just something that you know it, we just don't need to see that ever. We would assume it's kind of you know, like yep. It's just, that's kind of what I mean about. There's nothing in the scene that I felt gave us anything. It was all very much stuff we knew or didn't need to see. Yeah. So. Jace meets up with Rhaenyra and says it was a bold attempt. I admire you for it. Obviously, uh, talking about the attempt at claiming sea smoke. He says, they say you struck Lord Bartimus today in view of the staff and guard. The household is abuzz with it. And she says, he's lucky I didn't have his tongue. Jeez. Yeah. For what? That, that would have been quite an escalation. The, he just, at this point, it now comes across as just like, I guess it's just a mistake. Because it's kind of boring, isn't it? In normal circumstances, she may have been right in the way that he 
spoke to her so, I don't know, without a sense of a particular decorum, if you want to put it that way. But, like, mm -hmm. she's been a shit queen. And uh, there's just no repercussions for that. And every time her counselors try to push her in any particular direction, it's seen as, like, insubordination. Which is what counselors are fucking for. They're and I guess, I guess all of them should have learned from Asaria and instead said, you're doing a fucking bang-up, amazing, top-tier job. Excellent. Yeah, great um, work. Keep doing what you're doing. And then you're you need so to, like, slip your own plans in to make her feel like it's her plans. Like, you literally just say, hey, remember your plan to make me Hand of the King? That was a great plan. You were so smart for that. And then she'd be like, I... I, I did? And you're like, Yeah. And then someone else is like, no, you yeah. didn't. And it's like, no, she didn't. She was really smart for it. Let her do it. And it's like, I like you. You're supportive. Everyone loved her for it. <laughs> and everyone clapped. Um, yeah, and she says, I bring to mind too much of their mothers or their daughters. They must see in me a ruler, and the symbols of authority are not jewels and gowns, but the shield and sword. I find it frustrating that she yes. seems to be aiming for that as opposed to her decisions, which is what they've been mentioning to her over and over again. Symbols of authority are the crown and scepter, thank you very much. Well, it's also just not the point. They yeah. recognize her authority. They just don't think she's... They've been repeating over and over again, it's her indecisions and her bad decisions. Yeah, so the symbol of authority would just be a big old brain. Yeah. That's what that would be. <laughs> you know, how you, you how can... much did a sword represent Viserys ever? You, you had, was it, uh, yeah, was it Blackfire he was using? Yeah, but he doesn't ever like use it, and he's not ever well. So the, in a position it is where a, it seems like he it, wants it is to a be using it, symbol of feudal monarchy, right? I'm like, fine with that. It, it, obviously, I'm I'm just highlighting the story they've t chosen to tell. Yeah. That's my problem. Yeah. They could have chosen to tell the story that they're saying Rhaenyra is describing, but that's not what we've seen. I think if she had made several tactical choices that were amazing, that she wouldn't be feeling that she's not being listened to. Also, maybe if you had your hand of the king in the council meetings. For some reason, Corliss is just off in the fucking docks again. Corliss is just standing around. He spent so much of this season standing around. Kind of frustrating. Talking to fucking Alan about how he's like, I like you, Alan. It's like, I get what you're doing, but Corliss is a full-on character who needs to be influencing the, uh, the Black Council decisions. Yeah, 100%. We need way more Corliss. Yes. Especially because we have... We've... We've not had much of him at all in a long time. Mm -hmm. I miss him. I miss him too. Like and he needs to have a... Yeah, his reason to be involved in the story is very strong, especially after Rhaenysus died. Apparently he's getting a whole animated show. Oh, okay. I mean... Oh, know. all right. So here comes something really annoying that I don't think I caught in any other than my prep for talking about it today. She says... Uh, I'm doing all I can. I've directed Lord Mooton to march on Rook's Rest and send another raven to the Vale to persuade, and she's cut off by uh, some other shit happening. Um, or, or rather, she continues talking. But the point is that I was like, wait. Directed Lord Mooton to march on... Isn't that what Bartimus said for her to do? Wasn't that like a part of his... Pretty sure. Suggestion? And it's like, so you're doing the thing your counselor told you to do... In, uh, you after you did your plan which failed miserably you know what i mean it's just like so is he yeah. gonna appreciate the fact that you did the thing that he said to do are we ever gonna do that you know we talk all day and fucking night about how they don't take you seriously do you take them seriously what are we now doing like we're taking their ideas and just saying they're yours like she she said that to jace as though she did it like that was her decision and, um, yeah, I don't know, like, it just feels like there's a bit of a disconnect here on how she's operating versus how the show thinks she's operating. Because I think it would make a little for unfair. a... little unfair, yeah. I think it would make for a really interesting story if she was doing all of this same stuff, but the show was showing that she's not recognizing her own failings, you know? She's like, I'm so great, I'm doing so good, and they just don't like me. Because I'm a woman. I'm a it's really woman. not the problem from what we've been seeing, you know? Nope. Yeah, decisions, um, <laughs> decisions are gender blind. And so, uh, Missaria turns up and says, the plan <laughs> is going ahead. Here it comes, and we see the food getting delivered to King's Landing, which uh, they said they hope it's done under cover of darkness and gets to the, you know, the gets there and isn't interrupted in any way, but it should be mentioned, of course, if this was spotted by any particular ships 
or if it were known, it could easily be subverted, captured, and delivered as a gift, or rather supplies, that are, you know, the intended from the gullet, so to speak. As What I'm trying to say is, the whole plan hinges on them believing that Rhaenyra, at the kindness of her heart, was trying to supply them food, when that could be easily subverted if the, these boats were spotted early enough, or if enough of a, of like, Team Black, oh, sorry, Team Green were able to sort of retell the story to be like uh no this is our stuff and we're giving it to you but uh it would it would have required a, a bit of doing like you need to catch all these boats before you know most of them arrive not impossible but you know still a risky-ish plan to get all this to the people with uh with this could have spectacularly backfired yes a mm -hmm. little bit and and i mean you know messages can easily spread of rhaenyra's feeding us but you can also spread the message of rhaenyra's finally let up on the blockade because she feels bad that we're all dying i don't know that's true yeah there's what I'm there's a lot of, of stuff you could have done and it she could be giving us food at any time it yeah it highlights like an opportunity that we've lost with Masaria. If she was an interesting, well constructed character who got here, she could take that role of the, you know, how do you interface between you and all the people of the kingdom? Because that's kind of her thing. And so she's got, you know, them on her mind a, a great deal. And so she can use that to win favor for her claim to the throne. And that could be her usefulness or a big part of her usefulness to Rhaenyra. Uh, there is still a chance the Missari could turn out to be a big ol' uh, like like backstabber. And to be I honest mean, with you, if she did, it would do a lot to repair Missaria. It wouldn't do anything to repair Rhaenyra, though. Yeah, Rhaenyra's way too yeah, just trusting. Make her ultra of, gullible. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Alicent is still hanging out with Aegon as he's struggling, and uh, uh, all while says his grace sleeps nine hours of every ten, but he did open his eyes and speak, however briefly. I've seen a lot of people snapshot that and say literally me. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe on the weekend. Yeah, See, he is a relatable character after mm -hmm. all. That's quite a lot of sleep. So here comes the worst and most damning and horrifying news that you get in the entire season. Um, Alison asks after her letters to her father, and Orwell says, I've sent ravens again to Highgarden and to Old Town and now to all the great houses in the Reach, and there's been no word from Sir Otto. That is, uh, that is worrying news. Is he huh. safe? Is he all right? Is he all right? We could Where's ask Otto? those questions, you know, generally speaking, but when the show itself acknowledges he's been gone for a while, it's like, whoa... Don't like Surely, that. Surely, they're not getting rid of Otto. There's no way. There's enough self awareness with the show, right? To be like, no. Just please give him at least. I want. Uh, can I just get like four or five more scenes of him being golden? That's all I want before you do whatever you're planning to do. Please, just a little more. I just, I just, I just really like him. Okay. He's a really cool guy. Okay. They also mentioned that um, Old Town is having trouble now because House Beesbury has raised arms against uh, the Hightower host in response to what happened to Lord Beesbury, which is not repairing Kristen Cole's retarded decision to sit him down to death in season one, Ugh. but it's that's something. Episode nine, cancer. But well, yeah, well that's what I'm saying. Is like It's repercussions for that stupid event. So it's like, eh, I guess I, I like that. That they'd be like, you just killed our lord for no fucking reason, so this is what happens now. It's like, that is what should happen. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you catch a few of Alicent saying, I'm sorry, uh, several times to Aegon, which, you know, there's, there's lots to think about in terms of what exactly she means, but before you'd fully go into it, the next scene kind of illustrates it a lot. She goes to see her brother, Gwen, and, uh, she asks him a lot of questions that clearly tell you what's on her mind. She talks about, obviously, Otto being kind of missing, and he's like, well, if, if he was to be anywhere, he would be sending you letters, not me. And then she says, it wasn't really totally fair that you grew up on your own in Old Town, 
because uh, their mother died and Otto came with her to court, so he didn't have all of them. And she says specifically, like, growing up motherless, which is an interesting comment considering how much of a much more normal and nice person Gwen is compared to her sons when he didn't have a mother, but she was the mother to those fucking kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, yep. a, that's clearly on her mind as a as a thought. And she says, you know, well, what's, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's Dayron up to, who we haven't seen in the show yet, but we've heard of him. That'll be her other mm -hmm. son with uh, Viserys, who has his own Otto dragon, is, too. Right? Um, at this point, I don't know. Aaron has a dragon? He does, yes. Um, is a young dragon, I guess? I think it would or... have been a dragon that he was... It would have hatched with him being born. I So, so it's probably like a... I want to say like a 16-year-old dragon, something like that. Okay. My guess. I don't know. About, about how many years does it take for a dragon to be at like a, a mature enough fighting age? That's a really great question, Rags, because Drogon takes about seven years to be hyper powerful in Game of Thrones. Meanwhile, you've got um, Jace's dragon that's clearly not fully grown, even though he is more than double the age of seven, right? So I, I'm not I think so. I don't know. If yeah. I mean, even the the little ones kill a guy at the end of season two, and then they kill a bunch of people at the end of season three when they're a little bigger. They're like dog size, I guess. Listen, I love you, Mark, but I have no idea what that has to do with anything that I just said. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how deadly dragons can get. How well, no, we? but I assume Rise isn't. He's talking about maximum power, right? So like scaling oh. of they they're born to they've reached maturity. Um, well. Yeah. Oh, Drogon, yeah, like time. I said, he reaches probably what would be considered his maximum power level pretty quickly compared to what they seem to be showing the dragon's age in this show. Uh, I'm not sure if that's down to literally that, that all the dragons age differently, or if they have different ultimate sizes uh, just normally. like that. It's, like a, it's almost like a roll of the dice of what kind of dragon you'll get. Exactly. They haven't really given us much on that, but I do find it interesting the differences. Uh, I know there's been complaints about the references to the source material, like Cyrax is a lot smaller in the show than the books. Um, I think I think people are generally happy with the designs on the dragons, though. Uh, I am, If too. they're not happy with the designs of the dragons, we might just... We're, I think we might be overly picky. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, uh, there's going to be people who know this stuff a lot better, but yeah, that's the most that I can give you for um, answering those questions. Moving forward, however, she does talk to him about how she doesn't speak much with Daeron, and uh, it's because he's not sending as much letters himself either. And so Gwen starts describing him, and he says he's stalwart, clever, adept with his loot as he is with his sword, and he features likely features in the fancies of many a young lady. And then he has this, like, pause and then says he's kind which felt <laughs> deliberate like from him as like a reassurance and then he says yeah kindness is a quality lacking in his brothers and um, he says you did well to send him to ward because the red keep for all of its privileges may in fact be less than a salubrious environment for the forming of young men what a word eh salubrious yeah salubrious Certainly it's the environment, yes. Yes. Well, it, her response was, was it the court or was it their mother? And, mm -hmm. he, and the funny oh. thing is, that's a particularly like rough thing to say. And Gwade says, I'm sure you did your best. It's such a like, hmm. Oh, <laughs> she has absolutely no idea how to respond to that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot to take on. She's obviously going through some stuff and finally realizing a lot of things. Uh just openly admitting to someone because you know she just wants to express it to somebody at this point. She understands how much she failed. And, like, I can't help but uh, not only enjoy but celebrate the, the, the work they've done with her because this is something that we were picking it with her in season one and season two, and just gradually it's caught up with her while simultaneously draining her of everything she found meaning of in her life. Like, I love how much the show is making points about uh, this generational rot of, you know, the, the the desire for power and control and to prevent another party from getting any kind of hold on you turns you into this, like, insecure fucking vampire of anything positive. And it, like, destroys all the members of your family to the point where you not being in the life of your child is better for them. 
Mm-hmm. It's done really in a way that I just think is is rather impressive, and it does blow my mind that people think not only that Alison sucks, but that she's got nothing going on. It's nonsense. It's actually yeah, nonsense. That's crazy. Like I said, uh, I track the conversation about Hot D. There's a tweet. I wouldn't have minded uh, putting it on screen so I'm sharing with you guys, but I don't have it right now. But it was basically, um, it was it was like a semi-viral tweet, and it just said, I've, been, I've not been disappointed in a fandom as much as I have been in the Hot D fandom as of recently. And I can't help but assume it's because, yeah, a lot of the major sort of discussion about the show has been hypercritical of it which is bizarre because it's one of the best shows we've gotten in recent time yeah it's it's yeah. really quite good what are people seeing like I, like i told you man some of the complaints have been fucking crazy uh one of them recently and glidus was like fighting with someone over this uh they just had a picture of vagar and said this has to be like one of the worst dragon designs i've ever seen it's not even a dragon what what how that looks like dragon a dragon, to me. dragon man. it's a wyvern actually well, don't want to hear it <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, is is Vagar walking around on two feet very frequently? They call it a dragon. It's a fucking dragon. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the crazy, the crazy awkward thing for me is Vagar's my favorite. <laughs> I fucking love this old as shit granny dragon who, especially tied to Aemond, being this the one that was with Aegon the Conqueror, the last dragon from that era, and how fucking just horrifyingly monstrous it is and just this grand power in the universe while simultaneously being a creature that just wants to chill out and exist there's something so fascinating about it and then the design itself right looks so old all of the elements yeah, very of it, the, old the the teeth the wrinkles the, the jowls the, yeah. big, like, the, kind of the like, like, spikes of the horns chin. the little horns on it yeah so, and that's the thing. You'd be like, "Oh, so what about the others?" I'd be like, "I love all the others. I think they're fucking brilliant." And yeah, they're all the idea that the criticism would be, "Yeah, well, they're not dragons." I'd be like, "I don't. What? What are you even? Like, what, what are we? What's what happening? are they well, then? I mean, that, like, Describe that, them." That's down to the lore, though, right? Like, I mean, in the Monster well, yeah, Hunter universe, clear, every what, single animal is a is a wyvern. They, what, they what, refer um, to them all as wyverns, and some of them don't even have wings at all. The fight people have is usually four legs and wings as a dragon. Or two legs and two wings is a wyvern, and that's the rule, even though you can just say that's not the rule in your own universe, which is what yeah. having a dragon does. They call so it a, a dragon, drake? it's a dragon. Shut the fuck up. Like, well, <laughs> so what's a drake and what's a worm? I saw people say that drake is when it doesn't have any wings, and it's just a dragon without wings, okay. essentially. Which, and worm you know, is okay. when it's like, you know, the Chinese dragon style flying thing. The inferior design? Yeah. Well... <laughs> I love them all. I love my creatures in fantasy. I don't like the idea. Whatever that, it is in that look, setting, it's what they call it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Like that's whatever. what I mean. It's down to the lore. Anyway, a dragon in Hot D is a creature with two wings and two legs. An elf in Berserk is like a pixie. Mm hmm. Oh, it's all very confusing. Uh, but you you tend to go like I mean vampires across all of vampire fiction. The rules switch. Every single fiction you find, you gotta you gotta find out what what the what they're doing with them, and that's okay. I'm okay with this. Let people do their own shit. They'll come up with dynamic and fun ways to mess around with stuff. I like the dragons in House of the Dragon. I like the dragons. How is that controversial? Yeah. <laughs> it's not called House of the Wyvern. You <laughs> fool. House of the Drake. You toad. <laughs> you toad. It's such a fun way to think to call somebody. I gotta put that in a video at some point. Uh, the only other thing I was gonna say about the scene, obviously, is it's kind of like an awkward goodbye for her and Gwen. But I'm not saying this because of any other reason than having watched a lot of TV. She doesn't say goodbye to Cole. They just share a look for a decent amount of time, and the music seems a little sort of contemplative and sad. And then he he rides off. I was like, man, do you think the show that is aware that one. these are the, this is the last time those two will see each other? I'd say Very I think possible. Gawain's days might be numbered. He might be... Uh... Oh, and Cole. I... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... The thing is, they're heading to do the, the big fight, right? Which is going to be all of the foot soldiers, all the dragons convening at Harrenhal. So the idea that they're all going to survive is probably nil. <laughs> like it's, it's yeah. gonna, people are going to be dead. This Rainey's is the kind of event where named characters die. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just cinematic language. That's what they say. That's what you, that's what you yeah. Um, yes, Helena's sad because some of her bugs aren't singing anymore. And so Allison offers that they go pray. That will work out very well. Yeah. Meanwhile, Hugh accosts a man and steals his cabbages. You did it. You did this. <laughs> How could he? You're stealing my cabbages. I wonder if that's going to be because he's been uh, everything we've seen of him. He seems very up, upright, respectable type type guy, but he does beat someone for their food there, obviously for the sake of his family. But I wonder yeah. if that's supposed to be something we take from him as like a characteristic that, when pushed to the limit, I, he'll lose it a bit. Yeah, I think that. I don't think you can blame him much in that scenario. I don't think you can blame a lot of people. No, in that I don't scenario. think so. Either. It's not like, yeah, it's not like he does it because he wants to. He's just like, I gotta get food. It's literally stealing it. food for a starving family. Mm hmm. The excuse people get for looting. He's willing to do, he's willing to do that, basically. And so, with uh, all this shit having gotten to a boiling point, the, uh, the gals be praying, and the king's got to, like, you need to leave. There's like a riot happening. And uh, honestly, this would be a good example if we could spend a really long time talking about all the different ways this has been fully set up, right? The, the guilt in Alicent that would have taken her here, the lack of connection she has with her family members to try and drive her daughter to go with her. The riots obviously starting up because of the starvation and the propaganda from all the efforts of the people involved with that and the other thing. And then the King's Guard being hilariously ineffective at defending them thanks to Aegon's reckless choices about... Uh, Sort of re, uh, refilling those uh, empty slots. It, mm -hmm. it, it's like all this stuff has been put in place to create a payoff that is Alicent and her daughter nearly torn apart by peasants, which is like, you know, pretty uh, intensive. He, Alicent even gets uh, yeah, sliced. Gets yeah, she gets cut. And uh, the King's Guard, I, th I think, judging from future episodes, I don't think any of them die here, but they, uh, they come close. And... Yeah, they get beat up. Some of them get beat up by the the mob. Mm -hmm. And uh, I th I'm wondering, is there supposed to be? Is it intentional that, uh, or maybe I'm misremembering? But isn't um, didn't when Allison cut Rhaenyra in season one? Is that the place where Allison got cut by a peasant on her left arm? Yes, it is. Okay, well, there you go. I think. There's a lot to read into, especially her staring at it. I would imagine that uh, you'd have to be thinking about the decisions she would have made so long ago that would have all have led to all of this, you know, throughout her whole I life. Because that's that pain, yeah. Yeah, and then, like, like I don't know how else to put it. It's just like she's suffering from the mistakes that she made that she would have accused of Rhaenyra back then. And then the line Rhaenyra speaks back to her in that part, she says something like, uh, everyone can see you for who you are. And what's happening in this scene is she's, her own people are like trying to kill her while shouting Rhaenyra is the one true queen. You know, and, and Alicent already is at an all-time low of how she sees herself. Her insecurities would be cranked up to the fucking roof, and then her own people hate her, and just everything has fallen the fuck apart. And she's got that same wound from... Back when you could argue that was the beginning of her downfall, sort of. That's like the most unhinged mm -hmm. she ever was at that point. Yeah, um, demanding Lucerus's eye was was a, was a bit further than I even thought she was going to go in that scene. An intense moment, and yes, uh, just maybe a little bit as well of what the fuck was all of this, you know? Talk about a cycle of getting that same wound, and how do we get a, end up here? Remember when th things were nicer at one point? Things used to be, uh, things used to be all right. Things Even the last time, okay. the last time she talked to Rhaenyra, though, she was in the same sept and being given an opportunity to be like, "Hey, can we just try to resolve this peacefully? Because this is going to get absolutely terrible." Even and though there's nothing she could have done. She's nothing she could do. Probably, yeah. <laughs> no. This is what kind of sucks. But about I mean, the scene. I. I I'd imagine, though, she probably still is thinking, like, well, I mean, was there anything I could have done? Because I could have prevented this with the decision that I made there. Right? Well, if I hadn't misunderstood, you know, yeah. the I believe that... Um, I'm the reason this war started. After she has that conversation with Rhaenyra, we see her drinking a lot in episode four and contemplating the histories and stuff. I think what we're supposed to take from that is 
her struggling with the pain of realizing that she's kind of the cause of all of this, and then trying to just get some confirmation to know for sure that she misunderstood Viserys. Yeah, and then moving where is forward, this down? Did I miss it? She does what she does with Aegon that has the effect it does. So it's all knock-on effects, and then she loses her power in the council. Like so, Alison could have, with the knowledge she got from. Uh, Rhaenyra had some level of influence in the choices that would be made going forward even to try and influence some level of peace but she can't She's she had even less power than she thought and with the power that she thought she had she couldn't stop the war from happening if she had a better relationship with Aemon and he did see the writing on the dagger he might have been able to tell her about it immediately I think that would have to play into it. This is what I mean. The layers with Alison are insane. She lost her capacity to possibly have influence of ending the war, partly because she was such a shit mum. If those two loved her more than anything, they would probably listen to her a hell of a lot more. But, you know, this is yeah. how it turned out. Hmm. Next scene, Parenting important. we get Laris talking to Aegon about what's probably going to happen, which is you need to stop taking milk of the poppy because it makes you retarded. That's what we saw happening with uh, with Viserys for a long time is how Otto kept him like fully controlled. And uh, he explains, he's like, you know your brother is ruling right now and you know that your life is in danger. And uh, it looks like it's it's you and me, bud. That is essentially the pitch. And we get uh, more honesty from Laris here than I think we've ever seen. He basically explains his origin story. Cool cripple kids club. And it's um, yeah. it, it was discussed with a couple of streams I've been on, but it just I can't see this as anything other than sincere. It doesn't seem manipulative. He's like fucking crying when he's explaining this. Yeah, yeah I, I get I get the sense it's here, here, yeah. in good spirits in a sense that they both have to overcome uh, massive difficulties and burdens in order to like attain any level of prominence or success in life. It's the one thing that he was most prepared to use as a manipulation tactic because it's been his whole life. In as much as like this is still like the right play for him. Yeah. Because, you know, he does yeah. need it's to like, well, ingratiate be... himself yeah. with Egon. Think... He needs Egon. But at the same time, yeah, there is much more to it than just that in terms of how he's behaving in the scene. It's probably worth saying it's not manipulative or sincere. It's probably both. It's... uh. He's drawing on yeah, something yeah, real really to do something very important and useful. And, uh, yeah, It'll be easy to lie this time because I'm telling the truth. Excellent performance, and the part that stuck out to me is how pained he seemed that his father referred to the entire situation as like evil spells were cast. Like his birth was something of an evil event. Yeah, it was a negative thing. I mean, if that's something he was told, no wonder he's a bit weird. Yeah, I mean, this, it's it's a good bit of set, and then the fact that he says they'll they'll laugh at you, they'll stare at you, or they'll avoid doing those things, and they'll underestimate you, and that will be your advantage. Which is like, oh god, I can see why you're so vindictive, huh? You wanna yeah, yeah. wanna go get everybody, and yes, the telling Aegon he'll never run again might not have use of like fucking half of his body and, and shit. Just just preparing him for like we. uh Together, we can still make a difference, and I'm I'm genuinely curious how this is going to turn out. I don't know where this is going. Yeah, I'm really interested too, especially now that you know, knowing what Aemon thinks of Laris. Now knowing so Laris has three options, only like two of them. One of them's useless. One of them is probably not going to go anywhere. And Aegon is kind of his last chance in a way with those three, um, at least to get higher up. So, I'm I'm curious, and I and I do think there is a bit of earnestness in their connection potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, what would happen to Aegon? So yeah, I am interested to see what happens next between them. Yeah, and where he, does Laris uh... take Aegon? What what kind of person does Aegon become? Um, with uh, Alicent as a, as a mother and Laris as a father. So we'll see what Man, happens. What but... a great future he's got ahead. Hey, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. So next up, we have Viserys crying over the loss of Emma, and Damon just in the background watching it happen, and slowly walking toward him, and finally hugging him and being there for him. Which uh, yeah, 
how else can you summarize like this is such a huge moment for Damon obviously finally addressing a strong insecurity he has a huge regret he has and an inability to support the people he loves without thinking about himself I can't imagine anything other than this playing into his attitudes toward Rhaenyra he's gonna he's probably gonna drop his hole I am desperate for the throne she can join me on that front as a result of all of this, I imagine we're instead going to head toward he's going to support the hell out of her uh, because that was the missing component and that's what Harren Hall's given him as a journey. It's made him properly address it. Uh, you know what's funny, by the I way? So, yeah. he's I saw someone say they the cheaped back. out and they couldn't even get Viserys for this scene, like the Paddy Considine, because you could only see the back of his head. Fucking the opening portion of the scene is clearly him. Yeah, so what are they yeah, talking yeah. about? I was, I was looking at it, I was like, what are you talking about? Just stop. <laughs> just, just, what, what are they cheap about? If you don't pay attention, to, just be quiet, damn it. Be stop fair it. to the show. What are you doing? Um, but yeah, I, I'd imagine Damon would have seen this, not taking care of his brother, as the biggest mistake in his whole life, and the fact that he gets to do it here is super important, super meaningful. Yeah. And what happens? Recognizing it. He wakes up to the news that Grover Tully has died, which is the primary roadblock to making any progress uh, in the Riverlands. Yeah, because he's Might just like been... basically on pause as a person, and uh, with him being alive, then he can't really have anyone to treat with to get these families, you know, the rears and gears in the Riverlands. Might this have been three days after he talked to Alice? Oh, I I'd imagine so. Uh, Simon says, Riverrun's maesters have been at their wit's end. Our own healer, Alice Rivers, volunteered her renowned skills. She plied her craft, oh but there was naught to be done. Uh, there is a curiosity as well as Simon leaves with that information. He makes a very curious face. One could interpret it solely as he knew that Damon and Alice worked together to end Grover's life, or... Maybe it's something else. I genuinely have no idea, because I don't know what the full story is for Simon yet. I'm sure we'll find out. Um, yeah, once he leaves, you get a huge relief from Damon, because he gets to actually move forward with the Riverlands, and uh, I think he actually, like for the first time I think we'll ever see, and probably will ever see in future, he cries not in a, in a hallucination. This is just in real life. And I'd assume it's to do with the relief of being released from Harren Hall, so to speak, but also that catharsis he had from finally facing his uh, mistakes with his brother. Uh, I don't know how you can see all of these scenes in a row, the Harren Hall ones with Damon, and not yeah, think they're you, really good. How do you say <laughs> like, that they're trash? Or like, oh, this is boring, nothing's happening. It's like, lots is happening! I mean, th there's not even a redundant one. They're all addressing something. And they chip away, and they have different dimensions. And they brought back fucking Viserys and Rhaenyra's actors from... Uh, uh, you know. Plenty to, plenty to draw out of it, I think. There was also... Uh, the, the, when he gets told that uh, Grover's dead, he has this fucking expression that's such like a troll face. And again, just Matt Smith throws all these random expressions in that are so much fun. It's... um. So when I imagine if they'd chosen a different actor for Damon, they might not have been as lucky for. He's just uh, everything Matt Smith is in, especially Morbius, does an excellent job. He did carry true. that movie. That's true. Yeah. Um, I think I was, uh, the other thing I was going to say is there is I, I still the fact that Simon acknowledges Alice Rivers that way here. Uh, my running it was theory. Like the end. Right. Well, my running theory to try and explain it, because of course one would say, well, then she is real. And it's like, well, what if she was with Grover for longer than the three days and that she's on her way back now, but for real? Um, and that she only told him she was going there that three days ago as the other form of herself. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like that could go that way, but obviously the longer it goes on, the more conspiracy feeling conspiracy theory ish it feels yeah we I shall see you. so uh sea smoke he's um he's gone out fishing for uh, a dragon rider and he's found good old adam 
chases him around for a bit and you get this is obviously they for every dragon that is claimed i think in this show they've done a different version of it every time like you see a very different dynamic at play which um i'm quite thankful for even the failures this one uh, yeah you know, adam is terrified until he's like forced to lock eyes with sea smoke and address the situation in in a more meaningful way than oh no dragon like actually seeing the dragon then he calms down and i see that as the reverse of the the bad thing that happens with dragons right that like i'm take stefan for example he's like yes my queen i'll do this it's an honor I'm, i've got this and then he goes out there and he's terrified meanwhile this guy he's like terrified to begin with but then when he actually gets up close to the dragon it kind of just melts away and he's not scared at all it was something about it feels you know appropriate in some way and, Which uh, I suppose um, would probably have something to do with the fact that the dragon has obviously sought you out specifically. Yeah, spirit some connection in way. some way, shape, or form. Something magical. Who knows? If a dragon's coming to get you specifically, that could either be very good or very bad. <laughs> um, I, I suppose that the assumption would be that if 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 he was out to just get people, why would he be gunning for this one guy specifically? Yeah, what's going on? Before? T lets him know he cut him off in traffic earlier, and this is his revenge. <laughs> I saw that scene where you were looking at me when I was flying around. Dude, Sea Smoke looks so fucking cool, though, I'm just saying. That, he that does! That close-up no, you get of him. It, you know, it's been said many, many, many times, but the dragon designs are awesome, and it is really cool, the, um, the lengths that they've gone to to distinguish each of the dragons from each other. They don't look the same. They all have their own little features, embellishments, and their own flair. Yeah, they're, yeah, the colors and the shapes and their their wear. Um, it their is... wear is particularly cool. The the fact that they show their age with scars and holes and in, in wings and whatnot. Yeah, some of the wings are fully intact. I think um, uh, silver wings. They're like there's like no holes in them, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure she's a very old dragon. So, like, yeah. uh, whether or not they hit battle damage or not, I think there's not many holes in uh, Sea Smoke's wings either. Anyway, no, you know, cool scene and all, but uh, now we got to do the next one. Any of you guys know which uh, one's the next one? That's the ending. I've, um, I've, uh, I've, th I've, I've heard of, uh, mm -hmm. of, um, of it this It stars scene. our favorite character, Masaria. Yes, it's her again. <laughs> oh, so happy yes. she's back. Uh, you go, girl. I'd rather just... At summarize point, it i consider this have them be in love with each other this is like nuclear cringe so the summary <laughs> of it is the the plan with the the food delivery went well it's like koki doki and then rainier right. like i don't feel very much like i'm suitable for queen right now not feeling good about myself so obviously she's talking to Masaria because she's just a hype queen that that tells her everything she needs to know and so she says that uh she gives her backstory and then she ends it with saying, you're, um, like, the perfect person for this ever, and, and I mm -hmm. want you to rule, and I choose you, and you're the bestest ever. I was very, very disappointed in all of this because they hug, and then they start making out. Ugh, what? This was... <laughs> This Rene is one of those things. That, challenge impossible. <laughs> when you see yeah. this hat, this is one of those scenes where when you see it, you think, "Oh, this is a dream sequence. Someone's dreaming this. This isn't actually happening. This is a dangerous. Someone's nodded off." And the this <laughs> this is well, David I think, I think the problem Hall, is like but... when the when the shot hangs for like more than five seconds, you go, "Oh, <laughs> like it's just you know what's about to I happen." Think, um... But you're like, "But well, why though?" Something that they can honestly take credit for in terms of just uh, being able to... They, they really did capture the, the potency of cringe. The, the way they start to look at each other slowly... Like, almost everybody that I know watched this had the exact same experience of... What? 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 <laughs> like, it's just this, yeah. this gradually louder and faster what's until they actually kiss and you're just like, what? What? Where did this come from? It it's like one of the writers just wrote some fan fiction off yes. hours and well, accidentally wait, is, uh, submitted it, and it was like, "Holy shit, like, they shot it!" It's not unclear if it was improvised or not. No, it's clear. I I, I just agree with Mark that it comes across as though it's some weird yeah. fan fiction. 
Um, but no, everything this is... to do with Masaria. Just she has really strong self insert energy at this yeah. point. Is and it, is... actually, I'm the one who gets to advise the good queen, and she really loves me. And then we make <laughs> out, and we and I'm just really smart. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm really she smart. respects me. Turns out Alice Rivers has been real the whole time, but no. Masaria is the ghost. Oh. <laughs> I hope she's a It'll ghost. Be better. Soon. She's a ghost. Um, yeah, she. Uh, Emma Deossi is the one that suggested they kiss. They didn't originally kiss in the scene. Well, so then, what's the plan meant to be for those characters going forward? Don't know. Not sure that I even. Uh, I was about to say don't care. But what I mean by that is I wouldn't care. Like it, it's killing my investment in. Uh, obviously, their relationship, Masaria as a character, but then also, yeah, it, like I said, it's a tumor on Rhaenyra. It's annoying the hell out of me that she she's she has no character history that would support treating someone like this. I've heard such crap excuses, like uh, they share the same history. That's why she, I don't know, bonded to her so quickly as if she's a... When was Rhaenyra? The, a I mean, how do you move past the fact before. that fundamentally the reason why any of this is happening in the first place is because Masaria uh, handed Aegon over to Otto instead of, like, making any other choice. Honestly, Fringy, I she think was like... the short-term memory of a lot of people who, who just don't care about this stuff, is it's just gone. There's no... We, we've practically... That was this season, like, and we've moved so far past it as, like, she traitor... But, but, but the thing like, is, like, it was a couple of weeks ago in the in the actual timeline. No, I know, that's what I'm saying, is that it just doesn't get remembered, even though it's super important. And, like... She uh, sold secrets about their water. house that caused serious damage yeah. to them, and then she was just like, nah, and, I'm your friend now. And she was instrumental in putting Aegon uh, on, on the, the throne, throne, which yeah. has created this whole um, crisis in the first place, and yet Rhaenyra doesn't really care, because when she decided to let her go for no good reason at all, like it was completely detrimental to her to do that, she just so happened to walk past the twin, and then go back and tell her, and now that's put her in a position where she seems to have more influence than the hand of the king. Then he Corlys, is basically yeah. the de facto hand of uh, Rhaenyra, basically. And all she does is just gas her up, and, and then just make statements that the writer is basically trying to convey. Is these are true observations about the world and Rhaenyra and her standing in it. Like, she's such a frustrating character every time she shows up. It's like, ah, oh, all right, earning, here we go. She's not earning anything. She doesn't have to face exactly. the repercussions. She's been given it. Of the life she's living, the actions she's committing to, and she gets to benefit yeah, enormously. Like, Nobody else gets this kind of treatment in this show. I think that's, yeah, exactly. It's annoying when you see... Well, it's not annoying. It's it's good writing, right? When Allison gets, uh, you know, the ending of her storyline of like, yeah, you all of the decisions you made have ultimately led you to a position where you have no power at all. Or, you know, like Aegon brashly heading into battle because he needed to prove his own worth to himself because of his own, you know, like, problems with his image and relationships with his family members, and then that causes him to be uh, <clears throat> grievously wounded, which then will probably create a transformation in that character. Like, I can only assume that Aegon's going to transform into a very different character because of this. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that's so. storytelling. That's storytelling. Yeah, I'm curious Meanwhile, about that. <laughs> Masaria, she... Her punishment was essentially she had a bad episode um, where things weren't so great for like 10, 15 minutes. And then <laughs> she got catapulted to one of the most important and influential people in uh, Westeros, essentially. She has yeah. massive sway over Rhaenyra, more so than anybody else, even Corlys. And Corlys... Even Damon. That's another example of a character who's been punished, essentially, for a lot of the choices that he's made. He was so obsessed with legacy that now he's basically on an island alone, like with no family. Um, and, and yet even that hasn't earned him enough of a capacity to have any influence over Rhaenyra's opinions. Well, yeah, it's, um, uh, we'll talk about this next time as well. We're going to double dip because I despise it so much. But she goes out to see, someone says Sea Smoke is out there and he's got a rider. So she goes out and sees him and that's the end of the episode. Um, she goes and speaks to Adam and then she comes back home and there's this, oh God, I, my head almost exploded. They... Uh, Corliss comes into the council to say, hey, she's home and she's fine. They're like, well, where the fuck is she? And who's the writer? Sea smoke <laughs> and stuff. And he's like, Corliss is just like, I don't know where she is. She's not coming back yet. And they just hard cut to her hanging out with Masaria again. So annoying. I'm so frustrated 
Like, this is Corliss and the rest of your court, and you have shit to do. This random guy shows up with sea smoke, and you're just hanging out with Masaria. <laughs> you got... You have work to do, woman. Oh, it was so painful to watch. So painful. And so was this, by the way. She almost gets caught immediately. Which, by the way, not gonna look good when part of the propaganda that's made about Rhaenyra is that she's, like, the whore queen who has the bastards and stuff. Like, oh yeah, by the way, she's fucking kissing a girl who was in her prison a week ago, or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just, like, nice. Good job. Way to instill a lot of faith. It's, uh... Well, it feels like, um, something that uh, it, it does seem like... I don't know how much of it is meant to be an observation that the show was making, but just think about how much destruction is wrought on innocent people who are uninvolved, essentially because of family dynamics, um, having uh massive geopolitical consequences yeah. they're like oh well because this person doesn't get along with their mum, they make all of these choices that then cause a war like that there's that that the, the show is meant to be pointing out isn't that insane that essentially these stupid family dynamics are causing massive repercussions for tens of thousands hundreds of thousands even millions of people no but it but then but then it's, eventually it just like disappears right like at certain points with certain characters of Hmm, the repercussions of their fundamentally, like, solely self-serving actions um, just, like, completely evaporate. But here's the thing. The one thing they get right about this is the music is ominous when they're kissing. Definitely not yes. happy music. It's definitely, like, Do you think it's ominous because it's like, oh, no, what if someone walks in and sees well, this? Well, uh, obviously, for us, we would be like, the music should be that way because this is a terrible decision in many, 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 <laughs> yep. many ways. Um... The thing is, and this was a take I saw from many people, all right, this, this is not one crazy person, several very influential. Um, they were like, oh, they played the ominous music over the lesbians kissing, because you can't have lesbians. What? You can't I, I have was, lesbians. I, I, like, I was just like, yeah, um, like people don't start doing this. Is I the thought it was so fucking that all weird. of a sudden people don't like lesbians? They, I think the most, the best version of the argument was something along the lines of, you see, all the guys can fuck around, but the second Rhaenyra expresses any kind of connection with someone uh, that's not a man, and that's not necessarily the person she's married to, suddenly it's like the most sinful thing that's happened in the show. Why does this show hate lesbians? Oh yeah, because Aegon's a fucking saint. I don't yeah, even, absolutely. This is what I mean, I don't know what to say. Game of Th a Song of Ice and Fire's universe has never taken the position that <laughs> promiscuity is just automatically makes you a monster. It's more complicated than that. It's usually related to like these decisions as they relate to other responsibilities. Or even homosexuality for that matter. Well, it, it, sometimes it, it causes issues, but at the same time, like it happens a lot clearly and no one seems to really- They've definitely care. had lesbians and bisexuals and gays in Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon before. That's not new. It inflicted Pedro Pascal on every other movie or TV show that's happened since. I mean, I think it would have been Game of Thrones and Narcos that probably got him that. Yeah, probably. But, uh... I'm... And also, like, Rhaenyra is in a very, like, a, a special position where she in particular shouldn't be doing that because that has yeah. very deep political consequences. She's not just anybody. Well, and so some people are like, Damon's not gonna care. And... And I'm like, I don't know what Damon's gonna think of this. Remember, he was half willing to kill this woman. I'm very sad that he didn't, <laughs> like in episode if, one or whatever. If we want to talk about, like, I guess the difference in gender roles as relates to promiscuity, we can do that. But I don't think the show is uncritical of that, so I don't really know what to say. Oh, well, that's the thing. It's it's unclear what the show is doing with Masaria. Ultimately, we'll find out. Uh, like I said, if, if they make it so that she was manipulating Rhaenyra the whole time, I actually would consider that kind of bold and more interesting than anything else that they're more than likely going to do. Yeah, I, so. I don't I don't believe it, but we'll see. I hope, I guess. That wraps up that episode. <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, I mean, what an annoying well, note to end on. Oh, yes. I know, yeah, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, I walked away from it so happens. annoyed. Um, what was funny about it is uh, there were a lot of people who hated it, the episode itself, almost entirely because of that scene, and there was accusations it was being review bombed for lesbians. And I was thinking to myself, like, those. do you really think people would review bomb it for girls kissing? Do you really, do you really think that's 
Mm. Oh yeah, the lesbians characters. are famously loathed, and no one likes to see I them. Just my in assumption the world is, especially yes. My assumption is people were a little mad because of the storytelling aspect of Rhaenyra being this vulnerable, this trusting, and this invested in a woman she barely knows who's climbed the ladder faster than fucking anybody in this universe ever could. But maybe the thing is now, when you say, well, you know, a show gets review bombed, or, oh, this is the general, you know, take that people have on House of the Dragon. Now I have no idea what that even means, because it feels like it's so, um... I feel like my experience of watching the show is so, like, out of tune with uh, a huge amount of people, you know? Even yes, though we're correct. Uh, we do end up feeling a bit islandish. I will say, uh, you know, most of the takes we've gone through, I think uh, Ryan and Gary are on the same page. It's just... The, it seems that way. The world outside of the world that we have within sort of EFAP, FNT-ish. Well, it's, it's, it's just... What you see is like, oh yeah, Cole, you suck. I hate you, Cole. Huh, Allison, you're a bitch. Yeah. Don't like you. Yeah, Rainice. Woo, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Rhaenyra, yay. Like, that. that's it. I, I don't get it. Yeah, unironically that. It's, it, I don't understand and, and it. And then Aaron Hall, be boring. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. When are we leaving Aaron, Aaron Hall? Hall sucks. He's... You know, the, 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 to, they, it's like everything's fucking backward. Not everything, but most things. <laughs> I feel like a lot of these people are not going to like the fates of a lot of these characters. I won't get more specific, but mm. yeah. No, like it's... <laughs> I just don't know what the general audience really wants anymore. I don't know what the uh, after the dragon. I got no idea. Yeah. Also, it makes you wonder: Would all of these storytelling choices be fine if there were more? Um, just throw in. Take for example the Battle of the Burning Mill. If that were an actual full-fledged five-minute battle, if we then had, I'm trying to think of other opportunities for just fights to have happened and bigger events to take place. If they all did. Would that then make all of this stuff more palatable that people find to be less palatable, at least for now? I mean, ultimately speaking, the show is still popular. It's still over, like overall well rated and well watched. It's just the discussions I see online are very, very critical. And there's some stuff that I might be like, yeah, I think that was bit. like I saw uh, threads going being pretty critical of that kiss, and I was and for similar reasons. But like I said, there's so many weird ones that I didn't understand at all. And uh, I don't know, I've seen a lot of people already saying now, because apparently uh, the last episode, there's, I've seen people saying there's leaks of the final episode on TikTok. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. In any case... <laughs> like an hour and a half long up. episode? I don't, I don't know. In any case, people have been well, saying... Well, luckily, the people on TikTok can't watch anything longer than 26 seconds. Yeah, so, so we don't have to worry about... Possibly like, watch it. A lot of yeah, so we can't... Yeah, we can't... We're safe. It's it's contained there. It's quarantined. I was only seeing like 10% of the footage. In any case, I've seen the notion that's just like, wow, season two is just a huge step down from season one. It looks like the show's heading the way of like Game of Thrones season eight, which... Uh, as a sentiment, drives me up the fucking wall. <laughs> it's like people have forgotten just how bad that got. Yeah, we're not there. It's nowhere close. We can't, it's nowhere yeah, to say close. we're not there is is that's just not even capturing the not thereness of our not there. Very a friend of mine there. has been going through Game of Thrones later seasons again recently, and I've been around for some of it. And uh, yeah, just watched Beyond the Wall the other day. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're not even in comparable territory. Not even close to being close. No. There's still so many scenes that we have such like long ass discussions about what they could all mean and the journeys the characters are going on. I feel like we're very healthy. There's just problems, which is, to be honest with I you, so. what a golden world we'd live in if this was standard for TV. Oh, it would be yeah. incredible. Imagine what a world. Most, most shows were great and just had a few things to complain about. Yeah, if it was just intermittent bitching. <laughs> If it was, oh, most things are actually quite really, really good, and it means the things that are bad are just all the more disappointing. And they stand out more. Well, on that note, that is episodes one through six talked Ooh, about. We've got seven and Ooh, eight remaining. All righty. Would have been We're nice to have close. had the full ten, but, you know, fine, fine, whatever you want to do, HBO. It's okay. That's okay. Give me longer seasons. Well, yeah, I wonder why they uh, settled with that nice. instead of having 10. Is it a... I wonder what the... I agree, uh, we should get 22 episode, two hour episodes. I mean, that's, that's true. Is that the, episodes, the episodes are quite long. 
um yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know like 45 minutes you know a lot of them are, are an hour hour plus as yeah. much as i shake my fist i am pretty satisfied <laughs> you know With absolutely the story, there's a lot yeah, of good stuff right here. well yeah once we finish talking about seven and eight we'll do a, a sort of roundup of what everyone thinks of the season as a whole um but like you know and com maybe compared to season one but I mean, for the sake of saying, like, up to episode six, I'm happy enough. I, I don't, I don't, uh, broadly yeah, I speaking, so. it's Miss Masari is all I'm thinking about. Yeah, the big black <laughs> spot is, oh, funnily enough, the black spot is the blacks right now. Uh, there's not a huge amount not going on outside of Damon. Entirely, because you've got elements of, of, of interesting stuff going on with, like, Jace. I feel like he's, yes. uh, yeah, he's, he's been benefited good. greatly by this season. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate because the green side is like broadly really, really interesting. The black side is um, occasionally interesting, or, or like interesting in very specific places. Mainly Damon, who I've mm -hmm. been very entertained by his story this season. Yes, I it's love these hard you to put count in this as... in Harren Hall. It's tough to count him as one of the blacks, even because he's not really dealing with them at all. Well, he's off on his own adventure of sorts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his own little side quest in Harren Hall. Side questing at Luigi's mansion. Yeah. And it's fun on the bun. But yeah, we'll probably uh, wrap up there. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed our breakdown of these episodes. But for now, we're going to say goodbye and see you in the bye future. Bye. Yeah, see goodbye, later, everybody. everybody. We will see later you later. Later on, everyone. Bye-bye. Dragons. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Dragoons. <laughs>